three contributions to the theory of sex by sigmund freud section one the sexual aberrations deviation in reference to the sexual object the sexual aberrations the fact of sexual need in man and animal is expressed in biology by the assumption of a sexual impulse this impulse is made analogous to the impulse of taking nourishment and to hunger the sexual expression corresponding to hunger not being found colloquially science uses the expression libido popular conception makes definite assumptions concerning the nature and qualities of this sexual impulse it is supposed to be absent during childhood and to commence about the time of and in connection with the maturing process of puberty it is supposed that it manifests itself in irresistible attractions exerted by one sex upon the other and that its aim is sexual union or at least such actions as would lead to union but we have every reason to see in these assumptions a very untrustworthy picture of reality on closer examination they are found to abound in errors inaccuracies and hasty conclusions if we introduce two terms and call the person from whom the sexual attraction emanates the sexual object and the action towards which the impulse strives the sexual aim then the scientifically examined experience shows us many deviations in reference to both sexual object and sexual aim the relations of which to the accepted standard require thorough investigation one deviation in reference to the sexual object the popular theory of the sexual impulse corresponds closely to the poetic fable of dividing the person into two halves man and woman who strive to become reunited through love it is therefore very surprising to hear that there are men for whom the sexual object is not woman but man and that there are women for whom it is not man but woman such persons are called contrary sexuals or better inverts the condition that of inversion the number of such individuals is considerable though difficult of accurate determination a inversion the behavior of inverts the above-mentioned persons behave in many ways quite differently a they are absolutely inverted i e their sexual object must be always of the same sex while the opposite sex can never be to them an object of sexual longing but leaves them indifferent or may even evoke sexual repugnance as men they are unable on account of this repugnance to perform the normal sexual act or miss all pleasure in its performance b they are amphigenously inverted psychosexually hermaphroditic i e their sexual object may belong indifferently to either the same or to the other sex the inversion lacks the character of exclusiveness c they are occasionally inverted i e under certain external conditions chief among which are the inaccessibility of the normal sexual object and initiation they are able to take as the sexual object a person of the same sex and thus find sexual gratification the inverted also manifest a manifold behavior in their judgment about the peculiarities of their sexual impulse some take the inversion as a matter of course just as the normal person does regarding his libido firmly demanding the same rights as the normal others however strive against the fact of their inversion and perceive in it a morbid compulsion other variations concern the relations of time the characteristics of the inversion in any individual may date back as far as his memory goes or they may become manifest to him at a definite period before or after puberty the character is either retained throughout life or it occasionally recedes or represents an episode on the road to normal development a periodical fluctuation between the normal and the inverted sexual object has also been observed of special interest are those cases in which the libido changes taking on the character of inversion after a painful experience with the normal sexual object 
these different categories of variation generally exist independently of one another in the most extreme cases it can regularly be assumed that the inversion has existed at all times and that the person feels contented with his peculiar state many authors will hesitate to gather into a unit all the cases enumerated here and will prefer to emphasize the differences rather than the common characters of these groups a view which corresponds with their preferred judgment of inversions but no matter what divisions may be set up it cannot be overlooked that all transitions are abundantly met with so that the formation of a series would seem to impose itself conception of inversion the first attention bestowed upon inversion gave rise to the conception that it was a congenital sign of nervous degeneration this harmonized with the fact that doctors first met it among the nervous or among persons giving such an impression there are two elements which should be considered independently in this conception the congenitality and the degeneration degeneration this term degeneration is open to the objections which may be urged against the promiscuous use of this word in general it has in fact become customary to designate all morbid manifestations not of traumatic or infectious origin as degenerative indeed magnan's classification of degenerates makes it possible that the highest general configuration of nervous accomplishment need not exclude the application of the concept of degeneration under the circumstances it is a question what use and what new content the judgment of degeneration still possesses it would seem more appropriate not to speak of degeneration one where there are not many marked deviations from the normal two where the capacity for working and living do not in general appear markedly impaired that the inverted are not degenerates in this qualified sense can be seen from the following facts one the inversion is found among persons who otherwise show no marked deviation from the normal two it is found also among persons whose capabilities are not disturbed who on the contrary are distinguished by especially high intellectual development and ethical culture three if one disregards the patience of one's own practice and strives to comprehend a wider field of experience he will in two directions encounter facts which will prevent him from assuming inversions as a degenerative sign a it must be considered that inversion was a frequent manifestation among the ancient nations at the height of their culture it was an institution endowed with important functions b it is found to be unusually prevalent among savages and primitive races whereas the term degeneration is generally limited to higher civilization i block even among the most civilized nations of europe climate and race have a most powerful influence on the distribution of and attitude toward inversion innateness only for the first and most extreme class of inverts as can be imagined has innateness been claimed and this from their own assurance that at no time in their life has their sexual impulse followed a different course the fact of the existence of two other classes especially of the third is difficult to reconcile with the assumption of its being congenital hence the propensity of those holding this view to separate the group of absolute inverts from the others results in the abandonment of the general conception of inversion accordingly in a number of cases the inversion would be of a congenital character while in others it might originate from other causes in contradistinction to this conception is that which assumes inversion to be an acquired character of the sexual impulse it is based on the following facts one in many inverts even absolute ones an early affective sexual impression can be demonstrated as a result of which the homosexual inclination developed two in many others outer influences of a promoting and inhibiting nature can be demonstrated which in earlier or later life led to a fixation of the inversion 
among which are exclusive relations with the same sex companionship in war detention in prison dangers of heterosexual intercourse celibacy sexual weakness etc three hypnotic suggestion may remove the inversion which would be surprising in that of a congenital character in view of all this the existence of congenital inversion can certainly be questioned the objection may be made to it that a more accurate examination of those claimed to be congenitally inverted will probably show that the direction of the libido was determined by a definite experience of early childhood which has not been retained in the conscious memory of the person but which can be brought back to memory by proper influences havelock ellis according to that author inversion can be designated only as a frequent variation of the sexual impulse which may be determined by a number of external circumstances of life the apparent certainty thus reached is however overthrown by the retort that manifestly there are many persons who have experienced even in their early youth those very sexual influences such as seduction mutual onanism without becoming inverts or without constantly remaining so hence one is forced to assume that the alternatives congenital and acquired are either incomplete or do not cover the circumstances present in inversions explanation of inversion the nature of inversion is explained neither by the assumption that it is congenital nor that it is acquired in the first case we need to be told what there is in it of the congenital unless we are satisfied with the roughest explanation namely that a person brings along a congenital sexual impulse connected with a definite sexual object in the second case it is a question whether the manifold accidental influences suffice to explain the acquisition unless there is something in the individual to meet them half way the negation of this last factor is inadmissible according to our former conclusions the relation of bisexuality since the time of frank lidston kiernan and chevalier a new series of ideas has been introduced for the explanation of the possibility of sexual inversion this contains a new contradiction to the popular belief which assumes that a human being is either a man or a woman science shows cases in which the sexual characteristics appear blurred and thus the sexual distinction is made difficult especially on an anatomical basis the genitals of such persons unite the male and female characteristics hermaphroditism in rare cases both parts of the sexual apparatus are well developed true hermaphroditism but usually both are stunted the importance of these abnormalities lies in the fact that they unexpectedly facilitate the understanding of the normal formation a certain degree of anatomical hermaphroditism really belongs to the normal in no normally formed male or female are traces of the apparatus of the other sex lacking these either continue functionless as rudimentary organs or they are transformed for the purpose of assuming other functions the conception which we gather from this long-known anatomical fact is the original predisposition to bisexuality which in the course of development has changed to monosexuality leaving slight remnants of the stunted sex it was natural to transfer this conception to the psychic sphere and to conceive the inversion in its aberrations as an expression of psychic hermaphroditism in order to bring the question to a decision it was only necessary to have one other circumstance viz a regular concurrence of the inversion with the psychic and somatic signs of hermaphroditism but this second expectation was not realized the relations between the assumed psychical and the demonstrable anatomical androgyny should never be conceived as being so close there is frequently found in the inverted a diminution of the sexual impulse h ellis and a slight anatomical stunting of the organs this however is found frequently but by no means regularly or preponderately thus we must recognize that inversion and somatic 
hermaphroditism are totally independent of each other great importance has also been attached to the so-called secondary and tertiary sex characters and their aggregate occurrence in the inverted has been emphasized h ellis there is much truth in this but it should not be forgotten that the secondary and tertiary sex characteristics very frequently manifest themselves in the other sex thus indicating androgyny without however involving changes in the sexual object in the sense of an inversion psychic hermaphroditism would gain in substantiality if parallel with the inversion of the sexual object there should be at least a change in the other psychic qualities such as in the impulses and distinguishing traits characteristic of the other sex but such inversion of character can be expected with some regularity only in inverted women in men the most perfect psychic manliness may be united with the inversion if one firmly adheres to the hypothesis of a psychic hermaphroditism one must add that in certain spheres its manifestations allow the recognition of only a very slight contrary determination the same also holds true in the somatic androgyny according to halben the appearance of individual stunted organs and secondary sex characters are quite independent of each other a spokesman of the masculine invert stated the bisexual theory in its crudest form in the following words it is a female brain in a male body but we do not know the characteristics of a female brain the substitution of the anatomical for the psychological is as frivolous as it is unjustified the tentative explanation by b craft ebbing seems to be more precisely formulated than that of ulrich but does not essentially differ from it b craft ebbing thinks that the bisexual predisposition gives to the individual male and female brain centers as well as somatic sexual organs these centers develop first towards puberty mostly under the influence of the independent sex glands we can however say the same of the male and female centers as of the male and female brains and moreover we do not even know whether we can assume for the sexual functions separate brain location centers such as we may assume for language after this discussion two notions at all events persist first that a bisexual predisposition is to be presumed for the inversion also only we do not know of what it consists beyond the anatomical formations and second that we are dealing with disturbances which are experienced by the sexual impulse during its development the sexual object of inverts the theory of psychic hermaphroditism presupposed that the sexual object of the inverted is the reverse of the normal the inverted man like the woman succumbs to the charms emanating from manly qualities of body and mind he feels himself like a woman and seeks a man but however true this may be for a great number of inverts it by no means indicates the general character of inversion there is no doubt that a great part of the male inverted have retained the psychic character of virility that proportionately they show but little of the secondary characters of the other sex and that they really look for real feminine psychic features in their sexual object if that were not so it would be incomprehensible why masculine prostitution in offering itself to inverts copies in all its exterior to-day as in antiquity the dress and attitudes of woman this imitation would otherwise be an insult to the ideal of the inverts among the greeks where the most manly men were found among inverts it is quite obvious that it was not the masculine character of the boy which kindled the love of man but it was his physical resemblance to woman as well as his feminine psychic qualities such as shyness demureness and the need of instruction and help as soon as the boy himself became a man he ceased to be a sexual object for men and in turn became a lover of boys the sexual object in this case as in many others is therefore not of the like sex but it unites both sex characters a compromise between the impulses striving for the man and for the woman but firmly conditioned by the masculinity of body 
the genitals the conditions in the woman are more definite here the active inverts with special frequency show the somatic and psychic characters of man and desire femininity in their sexual object though even here greater variation will be found on more intimate investigation the sexual aim of inverts the important fact to bear in mind is that no uniformity of the sexual aim can be attributed to inversion intercourse per annum in men by no means goes with inversion masturbation is just as frequently the exclusive aim and the limitation of the sexual aim to mere effusion of feelings is here even more frequent than in heterosexual love in women too the sexual aims of the inverted are manifold among which contact with the mucous membrane of the mouth seems to be preferred conclusion though from the material on hand we are by no means in a position satisfactory to explain the origin of inversion we can say that through this investigation we have obtained an insight which can become of greater significance to us than the solution of the above problem our attention is called to the fact that we have assumed a too close connection between the sexual impulse and the sexual object the experience gained from the so-called abnormal cases teaches us that a connection exists between the sexual impulse and the sexual object which we are in danger of overlooking in the uniformity of normal states where the impulse seems to bring with it the object we are thus instructed to separate this connection between the impulse and the object the sexual impulse is probably entirely independent of its object and is not originated by the stimuli proceeding from the object b the sexually immature and animals as sexual objects whereas those sexual inverts whose sexual object does not belong to the normally adapted sex appear to the observer as a collective number of perhaps otherwise normal individuals the persons who choose for their sexual object the sexually immature children are apparently from the first sporadic aberrations only exceptionally are children the exclusive sexual object they are mostly drawn into this role by a faint-hearted and impotent individual who makes use of such substitutes or when an impulsive urgent desire cannot at the time secure the proper object still it throws some light on the nature of the sexual impulse that it should suffer such great variation and depreciation of its object a thing which hunger adhering more energetically to its object would allow only in the most extreme cases the same may be said of sexual relations with animals a thing not at all rare among farmers where the sexual attraction goes beyond the limits of the species for aesthetic reasons one would fain attribute this and other excessive aberrations of the sexual impulse to the insane but this cannot be done experience teaches that among the latter no disturbances of the sexual impulse can be found other than those observed among the sane or among whole races and classes thus we find with gruesome frequency sexual abuse of children by teachers and servants merely because they have the best opportunities for it the insane present the aforesaid aberration only in a somewhat intensified form or what is of special significance is the fact that the aberration becomes exclusive and takes the place of the normal sexual gratification this very remarkable relation of sexual variations ranging from the normal to the insane gives material for reflection it seems to me that the fact to be explained would show that the impulses of the sexual life belong to those which even normally are most poorly controlled by the higher psychic activities he who is in any way psychically abnormal be it in social or ethical conditions is according to my experience regularly so in his sexual life but many are abnormal in their sexual life who in every other respect correspond to the average they have followed the human cultural development but sexuality remained as their weak point as a general result of these discussions we come to see that under numerous conditions and among a surprising number of individuals the nature and value of the sexual object steps into the background there is something else in the sexual impulse which is the essential and constant End of chapter one
This is Books on My Mind YouTube channel. Listen to world's best and high quality audiobooks. Click on the subscribe button for more. Section 2 Deviation in Reference to the Sexual Aim. The union of the genitals in the characteristic act of copulation is taken as the normal sexual aim. It serves to loosen the sexual tension and temporarily to quench the sexual desire, gratification, and ugliness to satisfaction of hunger. Yet even in the most normal sexual process, those additions are distinguishable, the development of which leads to the aberrations described as perversions. Thus certain intermediary relations to the sexual object connected with copulation, such as touching and looking, are recognized as preliminary to the sexual aim. These activities are on the one hand themselves connected with pleasure, and on the other hand, they enhance the excitement which persists until the definite sexual aim is reached one definite kind of contiguity consisting of mutual approximation of the mucous membranes of the lips in the form of a kiss has received among the most civilized nations a sexual value though the parts of the body concerned do not belong to the sexual apparatus but form the entrance to the digestive tract this therefore supplies the factors which allow us to bring the perversions into relation with the normal sexual life and which are available also for their classification the perversions are either a antinomical transgressions of the bodily regions destined for sexual union or b a lingering at the intermediary relations to the sexual object which should normally be rapidly passed on the way to the definite sexual aim a anatomical transgression overestimation of the sexual object the psychic estimation in which the sexual object as a goal of the sexual impulse shares is only in the rarest cases limited to the genitals generally it embraces the whole body and tends to include all sensations emanating from the sexual object the same overestimation spreads over the psychic sphere and manifests itself as a logical blinding diminished judgment in the face of the psychic attainments and perfections of the sexual object as well as a blind obedience to the judgments issuing from the latter the full faith of love thus becomes an important if not the primordial source of authority it is this sexual overvaluation which so ill agrees with the restriction of the sexual aim to the union of the genitals only that assists other parts of the body to participate as sexual aims in the development of this most manifold anatomical overestimation there is an unmistakable desire towards variation a thing dominated by hotch as excitement hunger raise hunger sexual utilization of the mucous membrane of the lips and mouth the significance of the factor of sexual overestimation can be best studied in the man in whom alone the sexual life is accessible to investigation whereas in the woman it is veiled in impenetrable darkness partly in consequence of cultural stunting and partly on account of the conventional reticence and dishonesty of women the employment of the mouth as a sexual organ is considered as a perversion if the lips tongue of the one are brought into contact with the genitals of the other but not when the mucous membrane of the lips of both touch each other in the latter exception we find the connection with the normal he who abhors the former as perversions though these since antiquity have been common practices among mankind yields to a distinct feeling of loathing which protects him from adopting such sexual aims the limit of such loathing is frequently purely conventional he who kisses fervently the lips of a pretty girl will perhaps be able to use her toothbrush only with a sense of loathing though there is no reason to assume that his own oral cavity for which he entertains no loathing is cleaner than that of the girl our attention is here called to the factor of loathing which stands in the way of the libidinous overestimation of the sexual aim but which may in turn be vanquished by the libido in the loathing we may observe one of the forces which have brought about the restrictions of the sexual aim as a rule these forces halt at the genitals there is however no doubt that even the genitals of the other sex themselves may be an object of loathing such behavior is characteristic of all hysterics especially women the force of the sexual impulse prefers to occupy itself with the overcoming of this loathing see below sexual utilization of the anal opening it is even more obvious than in the former case that it is the loathing which stamps as a perversion the use of the anus as a sexual aim but it should not be interpreted as espousing a cause when i observe that the basis of this loathing namely that this part of the body serves for the excretion and comes in contact with the loathsome excrement 
is not more plausible than the basis which historical girls have for the disgust which they entertain for the male genital because it serves for urination the sexual role of the mucous membrane of the anus is by no means limited to intercourse between men its preference has nothing characteristic of the inverted feeling on the contrary it seems that the pedicatio of the man owes its role to the analogy with the act in the woman whereas among inverts it is mutual masturbation which is the most common sexual aim the significance of other parts of the body sexual infringement on the other parts of the body in all its variations offers nothing new it adds nothing to our knowledge of the sexual impulse which herein only announces its intention to dominate the sexual object in every way besides the sexual overvaluation a second and generally unknown factor may be mentioned among the anatomical transgressions certain parts of the body like the mucous membrane of the mouth and anus which repeatedly appear in such practices lay claim as it were to be considered and treated as genitals we shall hear how this claim is justified by the development of the sexual impulse and how it is fulfilled in the symptomatology of certain morbid conditions unfit substitutes for the sexual object fetishism we are especially impressed by those cases in which for the normal sexual object another is substituted which is related to it but which is totally unfit for the normal sexual aim according to the scheme of the introduction we should have done better to mention this most interesting group of aberrations of the sexual impulse among the deviations in reference to the sexual object but we have deferred mention of these until we became acquainted with the factor of sexual overestimation upon which these manifestations connected with the relinquishing of the sexual aim depend the substitute for the sexual object is generally a part of the body but little adapted for sexual purposes such as the foot or hair or an inanimate object which is in demonstrable relation with the sexual person and preferably with the sexuality of the same fragments of clothing white underwear this substitution is not unjustly compared with the fetish in which the savage sees the embodiment of his god the transition to the cases of fetishism with a renunciation of a normal or of a perverted sexual aim is formed by cases in which a fetishistic determination is demanded in the sexual object if the sexual aim is to be attained definite color of hair clothing even physical blemishes no other variation of the sexual impulse verging on the pathological claims our interest as much as this one owing to the peculiarity occasioned by its manifestations a certain diminution in the striving for the normal sexual aim may be presupposed in all these cases executive weakness of the sexual apparatus the connection with the normal is occasioned by the psychologically necessary overestimation of the sexual object which inevitably enroaches upon everything associatively related to it sexual object a certain degree of such fetishism therefore regularly belong to the normal especially during those stages of wooing when the normal sexual aim seems inaccessible or its realization deferred get me a handkerchief from her bosom a garter of my love faust the case becomes pathological only when the striving for the fetish fixes itself beyond such determinations and takes the place of the normal sexual aim or again when the fetish disengages itself from the person concerned and itself becomes a sexual object these are the general determinations for the transition of mere variations of the sexual impulse into pathological aberrations the persistent influence of a sexual impress mostly received in early childhood often shows itself in the selection of a fetish as benet first deserted and as was later proven by many illustrations a thing which may be placed parallel to the proverbial attachment to a first love in the normal on revient toujours aussis premiers amours such a connection is especially seen in cases with only fetishistic determinations of the sexual object the significance of early sexual impressions will be met again in other places in other cases it was mostly a symbolic thought association unconscious to the person concerned which led to the replacing of the object by means of a fetish the paths of these connections cannot always be definitely demonstrated the foot is a very primitive sexual symbol already found in myths fur is used as a fetish probably on account of its association with the hairiness of the mons veneris 
such symbolism seems often to depend on sexual experiences in childhood b fixation of precursory sexual aims the appearance of new intentions all the outer and inner determinations which impede or hold at a distance the attainment of the normal sexual aim such as impotence costliness of the sexual object and dangers of the sexual act will conceivably strengthen the inclination to linger at the preparatory acts and to form them into new sexual aims which may take the place of the normal on closer investigation it is always seen that the ostensibly most peculiar of these new intentions have already been indicated in the normal sexual act touching and looking at least a certain amount of touching is indispensable for a person in order to attain the normal sexual aim it is also generally known that the touching of the skin of the sexual object causes much pleasure and produces a supply of new excitement hence the lingering of the touching can hardly be considered a perversion if the sexual act is proceeded with the same holds true in the end with looking which is analogous to touching the manner in which the libidinous excitement is frequently awakened is by the optical impression and selection takes account of this circumstance if this teleological mode of thinking be permitted by making the sexual object a thing of beauty the covering of the body which keeps abreast with civilization serves to arouse sexual inquisitiveness which always strives to restore for itself the sexual object by uncovering the hidden parts this can be turned into the artistic sublimation if the interest is turned from the genitals to the form of the body the tendency to linger at this intermediary sexual aim of the sexually accentuated looking is found to a certain degree in most normals indeed it gives them the possibility of directing a certain amount of their libido to a higher artistic aim on the other hand the fondness for looking becomes a perversion a when it limits itself entirely to the genitals b when it becomes connected with the overcoming of loathing warriors and onlookers at the functions of excretion and c when instead of preparing for the normal sexual aim it suppresses it the latter if i may draw conclusions from a single analysis is in a most pronounced way true of exhibitionists who expose their genitals so as in turn to bring to view the genitals of others in the perversion which consists in striving to look and be looked at we are confronted with a very remarkable character which will occupy us even more intensively in the following aberration the sexual aim is here present in twofold formation in an active and a passive form the force which is opposed to the peeping mania and through which it is eventually abolished is shame like the former loathing sadism and masochism the desire to cause pain to the sexual object and its opposite the most frequent and most significant of all perversions was designated in its two forms by von kraft ebbing was designated in its two forms by v kraft ebbing as sadism or the active form and masochism or the passive form other authors prefer the narrower term algolagnia which emphasizes the pleasure in pain and cruelty whereas the terms selected by v kraft ebbing place the pleasure secured in all kinds of humility and submission in the foreground the roots of active algolagnia sadism can be readily demonstrable in the normal the sexuality of most men shows a taint of aggression it is a propensity to subdue the biological significance of which lies in the necessity of overcoming the resistance of the sexual object by actions other than mere courting sadism would then correspond to an aggressive component of the sexual impulse which has become independent and exaggerated and has been brought to the foreground by displacement the conception of sadism fluctuates in the usage of language from a mere active or impetuous attitude towards the sexual object to the exclusive attachment of the gratification to the subjection and maltreatment of the object strictly speaking only the last extreme case has a claim to the name of perversion similarly the designation of masochism comprises all passive attitude to the sexual life and to the sexual object in its most extreme form the gratification is connected with suffering of physical or mental pain at the hands of the sexual object masochism as a perversion seems to be still more remote from the normal sexual life by forming a contrast to it 
it may be doubted whether it ever appears as a primary form or whether it does not more regularly originate through transformation from sadism it can often be recognized that the masochism is nothing but a continuation of the sadism turning against one's own person in which the latter at first takes the place of the sexual object analysis of extreme cases of masochistic perversions show that there is a cooperation of a large series of factors which exaggerate and fix the original passive sexual attitude castration complex conscience the pain which is here overcome ranks with the loathing and shame which were the resistances opposed to the libido sadism and masochism occupy a special place among the perversions for the contrast of activity and passivity lying at their bases belong to the common traits of the sexual life that cruelty and sexual impulse are most intimately connected is beyond doubt taught by the history of civilization but in the explanation of this connection no one has gone beyond the accentuation of the aggressive factors of the libido the aggression which is mixed with the sexual impulse is according to some authors a remnant of cannibalistic lust a participation on the part of the domination apparatus a mock tigung's apparatus which served also for the gratification of the great wants of the other unto genetically the older impulse it has also been claimed that every pain contains in itself the possibility of a pleasurable sensation let us be satisfied with the impression that the explanation of this perversion is by no means satisfactory and that it is possible that many psychic efforts unite themselves into one effect the most striking peculiarity of this perversion lies in the fact that its active and passive forms are regularly encountered together in the same person he who experiences pleasure by causing pain to others in sexual relations is also able to experience the pain emanating from sexual relations as pleasure a sadist is simultaneously a masochist though either the active or the passive side of the perversion may be more strongly developed and thus represent his preponderate sexual activity we thus see that certain perverted propensities regularly appear in contrasting pairs a thing which in view of the material to be produced later must claim great theoretical value it is furthermore clear that the existence of the contrast sadism and masochism cannot readily be attributed to the mixture of aggression on the other hand one may be tempted to connect such simultaneously existing contrasts with the united contrast of male and female in bisexuality the significance of which is reduced in psychoanalysis to the contrast of activity and passivity End of deviation in reference to the sexual aim section three general statements applicable to all perversions variation and disease the physicians who had first studied the perversions in pronounced cases and under peculiar conditions were naturally inclined to attribute to them the character of a morbid or degenerative sign similar to the inversions this view however is easier to refute in this than in the former case everyday experience has shown that most of these transgressions at least the milder ones are seldom wanting as components in the sexual life of normals who look upon them as upon other intimacies wherever the conditions are favorable such a perversion may for a long time be substituted by a normal person for the normal sexual aim or it may be placed near it in no normal person does the normal sexual aim lack some designable perverse element and this universality suffices in itself to prove the inexpediency of an opprobrious application of the name perversion in the realm of the sexual life one is sure to meet with exceptional difficulties which are at present really unsolvable if one wishes to draw a sharp line between the mere variations within physiological limits and morbid symptoms nevertheless the quality of the new sexual aim in some of these perversions is such as to require special notice some of the perversions are in content so distant from the normal that we cannot help calling them morbid 
especially those in which the sexual impulse in overcoming the resistances shame loathing fear and pain has brought about surprising results licking of feces and violation of cadavers yet even in these cases one ought not to feel certain of regularly finding among the perpetrators persons of pronounced abnormalities or insane minds we cannot lose sight of the fact that persons who otherwise behave normally are recorded as sick in the realm of the sexual life where they are dominated by the most unbridled of all impulses on the other hand a manifest abnormality in any other relation in life generally shows an undercurrent of abnormal sexual behavior in the majority of cases we are able to find the morbid character of the perversion not in the content of the new sexual aim but in its relation to the normal it is morbid if the perversion does not appear beside the normal sexual aim and sexual object where favorable circumstances promote it and unfavorable impede the normal or if it has under all circumstances repressed and supplanted the normal the exclusiveness and fixation of the perversion justifies us in considering it a morbid symptom the psychic participation in the perversions perhaps it is precisely in the most abominable perversions that we must recognize the most prolific psychic participation for the transformation of the sexual impulse in these cases a piece of psychic work has been accomplished in which in spite of its gruesome success the value of an idealization of the impulse cannot be disputed the omnipotence of love nowhere perhaps shows itself stronger than in this one of her aberrations the highest and the lowest everywhere in sexuality hang most intimately together from heaven through the world to hell two results in the study of perversions we have gained an insight into the fact that the sexual impulse has to struggle against certain psychic forces resistances among which shame and loathing are most prominent we may presume that these forces are employed to confine the impulse within the accepted normal limits and if they have become developed in the individual before the sexual impulse has attained its full strength it is really they which have directed it in the course of development we have furthermore remarked that some of the examined perversions can be comprehended only by assuming the union of many motives if they are amenable to analysis disintegration they must be of a composite nature this may give us a hint that the sexual impulse itself may not be something simple that it may on the contrary be composed of many components which detach themselves to form perversions our clinical observation thus calls our attention to fusions which have lost their expression in the uniform normal behavior End of General Statements Applicable to All Perversions Section 4. The Sexual Impulse in Neurotics Psychoanalysis A proper contribution to the knowledge of the sexual impulse in persons who are at least related to the normal can be gained only from one source and is accessible only by one definite path. There is only one way to obtain a thorough and unerring solution of problems in the sexual life of so-called psychoneurotics, hysteria, obsessions, the wrongly named neurasthenia, and surely also dementia, precox, and paranoia, and that is by subjecting them to the psychoanalytic investigations propounded by J. Brewer and myself in 1893, which we call the cathartic treatment. I must repeat what I have said in my published work, that these psychoneuroses, as far as my experience goes, are based on sexual motive powers. I do not mean that the energy of the sexual impulse merely contributes to the forces supporting the morbid manifestations, symptoms, but I wish distinctly to maintain that this supplies the only constant and the most important source of energy in the neurosis, so that the sexual life of such persons manifests itself either exclusively preponderately or partially in these symptoms as i have already stated in different places the symptoms are the sexual activities of the patient the proof for this assertion i have obtained from the psychoanalysis of hysterics and other neurotics during a period of twenty years 
the results of which i hope to give later in a detailed account psychoanalysis removes the symptoms of hysteria on the supposition that they are the substitutes the transcriptions as it were for a series of emotionally accentuated psychic processes wishes and desires to which a passage for their discharge through the conscious psychic activities has been cut off by a special process repression these thought formations which are restrained in the state of the unconscious strive for expression that is for discharge in conformity to their affective value and find such in hysteria through a process of conversion into somatic phenomena the hysterical symptoms if leger artists and with the aid of a special technique retrogressive transformations of the symptoms into the effectful and conscious thoughts can be effected it then becomes possible to get the most accurate information about the nature and origin of these previously unconscious psychic formations results of psychoanalysis in this manner it has been discovered that the symptoms represent the equivalent for the strivings which receive their strength from the source of the sexual impulse this fully concurs with what we know of the character of hysterics which we have taken as models for all psychoneurotics before they have become diseased and with what we know concerning the causes of the disease the hysterical character evinces a part of sexual repression which reaches beyond the normal limits an exaggeration of the resistances against the sexual impulse which we know as shame and loathing it is an instinctive flight from intellectual occupation with the sexual problem the consequence of which in pronounced cases is a complete sexual ignorance which is preserved till the age of sexual maturity is attained this feature so characteristic of hysteria is not seldom concealed in crude observation by the existence of the second constitutional factor of hysteria namely the enormous development of the sexual craving but the psychological analysis will always reveal it and solves the very contradictory enigma of hysteria by proving the existence of the contrasting pair an immense sexual desire and a very exaggerated sexual rejection the provocation of the disease in hysterically predisposed persons is brought about if in consequence of their progressive maturity or external conditions of life they are earnestly confronted with the real sexual demand between the pressure of the craving and the opposition of the sexual rejection an outlet for the disease results which does not remove the conflict but seeks to elude it by transforming the libidinous strivings into symptoms it is an exception only in appearance if a hysterical person say a man becomes subject to some banal emotional disturbance to a conflict in the centre of which there is no sexual interest psychoanalysis will regularly show that it is the sexual components of the conflict which make the disease possible by withdrawing the psychic processes from normal adjustment neurosis and perversion a great part of the opposition to my assertion is explained by the fact that the sexuality from which i deduce the psychoneurotic symptoms is thought of as coincident with the normal sexual impulse but psychoanalysis teaches us better than this it shows that the symptoms do not by any means result at the expense only of the so-called normal sexual impulse at least not exclusively or preponderantly but they represent the converted expression of impulses which in a broader sense might be designated as perverse if they could manifest themselves directly in fantasies and acts without deviating from consciousness the symptoms are therefore partially formed at the cost of abnormal sexuality the neurosis is so to say the negative of the perversion the sexual impulse of the psychoneurotic shows all the aberrations which we have studied as variations of the normal and as manifestations of morbid sexual life a in all the neurotics without exception we find feelings of inversion in the unconscious psychic life fixation of libido on persons of the same sex it is impossible without a deep and searching discussion adequately to appreciate the significance of this factor for the formation of the picture of the disease i can only assert that the unconscious propensity to inversion is never wanting and is particularly of immense service in explaining male hysteria 
b all the inclinations to anatomical transgression can be demonstrated in psychoneurotics in the unconscious and as symptom creators of special frequency and intensity are those which impart to the mouth and the mucous membrane of the anus the role of genitals c the partial desires which usually appear in contrasting pairs play a very prominent role among the symptom creators in the psychoneuroses we have learned to know them as carriers of new sexual aims such as peeping mania exhibitionism and the actively and passively formed impulses of cruelty the contribution of the last is indispensable for the understanding of the morbid nature of the symptoms it almost regularly controls some portion of the social behavior of the patient the transformation of love into hatred of tenderness into hostility which is characteristic of a large number of neurotic cases and apparently of all cases of paranoia takes place by means of the union of cruelty with the libido the interest in these deductions will be more heightened by certain peculiarities of the diagnosis of facts alpha there is nothing in the unconscious streams of thought of the neuroses which would correspond to an inclination towards fetishism a circumstance which throws light on the psychological peculiarity of this well understood perversion beta wherever any such impulse is found in the unconscious which can be paired with a contrasting one it can regularly be demonstrated that the latter too is effective every active perversion is here accompanied by its passive counterpart he who in the unconscious is an exhibitionist is at the same time a voyeur he who suffers from sadistic feelings as a result of repression will also show another reinforcement of the symptoms from the source of masochistic tendencies the perfect concurrence with the behavior of the corresponding positive perversions is certainly very noteworthy in the picture of the disease however the preponderant role is played by either one or the other of the opposing tendencies gamma in a pronounced case of psychoneurosis we seldom find the development of one single perverted impulse usually there are many and regularly there are traces of all perversions the individual impulse however on account of its intensity is independent of the development of the others but the study of the positive perversions gives us the accurate counterpart to it end of chapter four this is books on my mind youtube channel listen to world's best and high quality audiobooks chapter five partial impulses and erogenous zones explanation of the manifest preponderance of sexual perversions in the psychoneuroses reference to the infantilism of sexuality partial impulses and erogenous zones keeping in mind what we have learned from the examination of the positive and negative perversions it becomes quite obvious that they can be referred to a number of partial impulses which are not however primary but are subject to further analysis by an impulse we can understand in the first place nothing but the psychic representative of a continually flowing internal somatic source of excitement in contradistinction to the stimulus which is produced by isolated excitements coming from without the impulse is thus one of the concepts marking the limits between the psychic and the physical the simplest and most obvious assumption concerning the nature of the impulses would be that in themselves they possess no quality but are only taken into account as a measure of the demand for effort in the psychic life what distinguishes the impulses from one another and furnishes them with specific attributes is their relation to their somatic sources and to their aims the source of the impulse is an exciting process in an organ and the immediate aim of the impulse lies in the elimination of this organic stimulus another preliminary assumption in the theory of the impulse which we cannot relinquish states that the bodily organs furnish two kinds of excitements which are determined by differences of a chemical nature one of these forms of excitement we designate as the specifically sexual and the concerned organ as the erogenous zone 
while the sexual element emanating from it is the partial impulse in the perversions which claim sexual significance for the oral cavity and the anal opening the part played by the erogenous zone is quite obvious it behaves in every way like a part of the sexual apparatus in hysteria these parts of the body as well as the tracts of mucous membrane proceeding from them become the seat of new sensations and innervating changes in a manner similar to the real genitals when under the excitement of normal sexual processes the significance of the erogenous zones in the psychoneuroses as additional apparatus and substitutes for the genitals appears to be most prominent in hysteria though that does not signify that it is of lesser validity in the other morbid forms it is not so recognizable in compulsion neurosis and paranoia because here the symptom formation takes place in regions of the psychic apparatus which lie at a great distance from the central locations for bodily control the more remarkable thing in the compulsion neurosis is the significance of the impulses which create new sexual aims and appear independently of the erogenous zones nevertheless the eye corresponds to an erogenous zone in the looking and exhibition mania while the skin takes on the same part in the pain and cruelty components of the sexual impulse the skin which in special parts of the body becomes differentiated as sensory organs and modified by the mucous membrane is the erogenous zone patexogen explanation of the manifest preponderance of sexual perversions in the psychoneuroses the sexuality of psychoneurotics has perhaps been placed in a false light by the above discussions it appears that the sexual behavior of the psychoneurotic approaches in predisposition to the pervert and deviates by just so much from the normal nevertheless it is very possible that the constitutional disposition of these patients besides containing an immense amount of sexual repression and a predominant force of sexual impulse also possesses an unusual tendency to perversions in the broadest sense however an examination of milder cases shows that the last assumption is not an absolute requisite or at least that in pronouncing judgment on the morbid effects one ought to discount the effect of one of the factors in most psychoneurotics the disease first appears after puberty following the demands of the normal sexual life against these the repression above all directs itself or the disease comes on later owing to the fact that the libido is unable to attain normal sexual gratification in both cases the libido behaves like a stream the principal bed of which is dammed it fills the collateral roads which until now perhaps have been empty thus the manifestly great though to be sure negative tendency to perversion in psychoneurotics may be collaterally conditioned at any rate it is certainly collaterally increased the fact of the matter is that the sexual repression has to be added as an inner factor to such external ones as restriction of freedom inaccessibility to the normal sexual object dangers of the normal sexual act etc which cause the origin of perversions in individuals who might have otherwise remained normal in individual cases of neurosis the behavior may be different now the congenital force of the tendency to perversion may be more decisive and at other times more influence may be exerted by the collateral increase of the same through the deviation of the libido from the normal sexual aim and object it would be unjust to construe a contrast where a cooperation exists the greatest results will always be brought about by a neurosis if constitution and experience cooperate in the same direction a pronounced constitution may perhaps be able to dispense with the assistance of daily impressions 
while a profound disturbance in life may perhaps bring on a neurosis even in an average constitution these views similarly hold true in the etiological significance of the congenital and the accidental experiences in other spheres if however preference is given to the assumption that an especially formed tendency to perversions is characteristic of the psychoneurotic constitution there is a prospect of being able to distinguish a multiformity of such constitutions in accordance with the congenital preponderance of this or that erogenous zone or of this or that partial impulse whether there is a special relationship between the predisposition to perversions and the selection of the morbid picture has not like many other things in this realm been investigated reference to the infantilism of sexuality by demonstrating the perverted feelings as symptomatic formations in psychoneurotics we have enormously increased the number of persons who can be added to the perverts this is not only because neurotics represent a very large proportion of humanity but we must consider also that the neuroses and all their gradations run in an uninterrupted series to the normal state mebius was quite justified in saying that we are all somewhat hysterical hence the very wide dissemination of perversions urged us to assume that the predisposition to perversions is no rare peculiarity but must form a part of the normally accepted constitution we have heard that it is a question whether perversions should be referred to congenital determinations or whether they originate from accidental experiences just as binet showed in fetishisms now we are forced to the conclusion that there is indeed something congenital at the basis of perversions but it is something which is congenital in all persons which as a predisposition may fluctuate in intensity and is brought into prominence by influences of life we deal here with congenital roots in the constitution of the sexual impulse which in one series of cases develop into real carriers of sexual activity perverts while in other cases they undergo an insufficient suppression repression so that as morbid symptoms they are enabled to attract to themselves in a roundabout way a considerable part of the sexual energy while again in favourable cases between the two extremes they originate the normal sexual life through effective restrictions and other elaborations but we must also remember that the assumed constitution which shows the roots of all perversions will be demonstrable only in the child though all impulses can be manifested in it only in moderate intensity if we are led to suppose that neurotics conserve the infantile state of their sexuality or return to it our interest must then turn to the sexual life of the child and we will then follow the play of influences which control the processes of development of the infantile sexuality up to its termination in a perversion a neurosis or a normal sexual life End of chapter five chapter six the infantile sexuality the sexual latency period of childhood and its interruptions manifestations of the infantile sexuality the sexual aim of the infantile sexuality the infantile sexuality it is a part of popular belief about the sexual impulse that it is absent in childhood and that it first appears in the period of life known as puberty this though a common error is serious in its consequences and is chiefly due to our present ignorance of the fundamental principles of the sexual life a comprehensive study of the sexual manifestations of childhood would probably reveal to us the existence of the essential features of the sexual impulse and would make us acquainted with its development and its composition from various sources 
the neglect of the infantile it is remarkable that those writers who endeavour to explain the qualities and reactions of the adult individual have given so much more attention to the ancestral period than to the period of the individual's own existence that is they have attributed more influence to heredity than to childhood as a matter of fact it might well be supposed that the influence of the latter period would be easier to understand and that it would be entitled to more consideration than heredity to be sure one occasionally finds in medical literature notes on the premature sexual activities of small children about erections and masturbation and even actions resembling coitus but these are referred to merely as exceptional occurrences as curiosities or as deterring examples of premature perversity no author has to my knowledge recognized the normality of the sexual impulse in childhood and in the numerous writings on the development of the child the chapter on sexual development is usually passed over infantile amnesia this remarkable negligence is due partly to conventional considerations which influence the writers on account of their own bringing up and partly to a psychic phenomenon which has thus far remained unexplained i refer to the peculiar amnesia which veils from most people not from all the first years of their childhood usually the first six or eight years so far it has not occurred to us that this amnesia ought to surprise us though we have good reasons for surprise for we are informed that in those years from which we later obtain nothing except a few incomprehensible memory fragments we have vividly reacted to impressions that we have manifested pain and pleasure like any human being that we have evinced love jealousy and other passions as they then affected us indeed we are told that we have uttered remarks which proved to grown-ups that we possessed understanding and a budding power of judgment still we know nothing of all this when we become older why does our memory lag behind all our other psychic activities we really have reason to believe that at no time of life are we more capable of impressions and reproductions than during the years of childhood on the other hand we must assume or we may convince ourselves through psychological observations on others that the very impressions which we have forgotten have nevertheless left the deepest traces in our psychic life and acted as determinants for our whole future development we conclude therefore that we do not deal with a real forgetting of infantile impressions but rather with an amnesia similar to that observed in neurotics for later experiences the nature of which consists in their being detained from consciousness repression but what forces bring about this repression of the infantile impressions he who can solve this riddle will also explain hysterical amnesia we shall not however hesitate to assert that the existence of the infantile amnesia gives us a new point of comparison between the psychic states of the child and those of the psychoneurotic we have already encountered another point of comparison when confronted by the fact that the sexuality of the psychoneurotic preserves the infantile character or has returned to it may there not be an ultimate connection between the infantile and the hysterical amnesias the connection between the infantile and the hysterical amnesias is really more than a mere play of wit the hysterical amnesia which serves the repression can only be explained by the fact that the individual already possesses a sum of recollections which have been withdrawn from conscious disposal and which by associative connection now sees that which is acted upon by the repelling forces of the repression emanating from consciousness we may say that without infantile amnesia there would be no hysterical amnesia i believe that the infantile amnesia which causes the individual to look upon his childhood as if it were a prehistoric time and conceals from him the beginning of his own sexual life that this amnesia is responsible for the fact that one does not usually attribute any value 
to the infantile period in the development of the sexual life one single observer cannot fill the gap which has been thus produced in our knowledge as early as eighteen ninety six i had already emphasized the significance of childhood for the origin of certain important phenomena connected with the sexual life and since then i have not ceased to put into the foreground the importance of the infantile factor for sexuality the sexual latency period of childhood and its interruptions the extraordinary frequent discoveries of apparently abnormal and exceptional sexual manifestations in childhood as well as the discovery of infantile reminiscences in neurotics which were hitherto unconscious allow us to sketch the following picture of the sexual behavior of childhood it seems certain that the newborn child brings with it the germs of sexual feelings which continue to develop for some time and then succumb to a progressive suppression which is in turn broken through by the proper advances of the sexual development and which can be checked by individual idiosyncrasies nothing is known concerning the laws and periodicity of this oscillating course of development it seems however that the sexual life of the child mostly manifests itself in the third or fourth year in some form accessible to observation the sexual inhibition it is during this period of total or at least partial latency that the psychic forces develop which later act as inhibitions on the sexual life and narrow its direction like dams these psychic forces are loathing shame and moral and aesthetic ideal demands we may gain the impression that the erection of these dams in the civilized child is the work of education and surely education contributes much to it in reality however this development is organically determined and can occasionally be produced without the help of education indeed education remains properly within its assigned realm only if it strictly follows the path of the organic determinant and impresses it somewhat cleaner and deeper reaction formation and sublimation what are the means that accomplish these very important constructions so significant for the later personal culture and normality they are probably brought about at the cost of the infantile sexuality itself the influx of which has not stopped even in this latency period the energy of which indeed has been turned away either wholly or partially from sexual utilization and conducted to other aims the historians of civilization seem to be unanimous in the opinion that such deviation of sexual motive powers from sexual aims to new aims a process which merits the name of sublimation has furnished powerful components for all cultural accomplishments we will therefore add that the same process acts in the development of every individual and that it begins to act in the sexual latency period we can also venture an opinion about the mechanisms of such sublimation the sexual feelings of these infantile years on the one hand could not be utilizable since the procreating functions are postponed this is the chief character of the latency period on the other hand they would in themselves be perverse as they would emanate from erogenous zones and would be born of impulses which in the individual's course of development could only evoke a feeling of displeasure they therefore awaken contrary forces feelings of reaction which in order to suppress such displeasure build up the above-mentioned psychic dams loathing shame and morality the interruptions of the latency period without deluding ourselves as to the hypothetical nature and deficient clearness of our understanding regarding the infantile period of latency and delay we will return to reality and state that such a utilization of the infantile sexuality represents an ideal bringing up from which the development of the individual usually deviates in some measure and often very considerably 
a portion of the sexual manifestation which has withdrawn from sublimation occasionally breaks through or a sexual activity remains throughout the whole duration of the latency period until the reinforced breaking through of the sexual impulse in puberty in so far as they have paid any attention to infantile sexuality the educators behave as if they shared our views concerning the formation of the moral forces of defence at the cost of sexuality and as if they knew that sexual activity makes the child uneducable for the educators consider all sexual manifestations of the child as an evil in the face of which little can be accomplished we have however every reason for directing our attention to those phenomena so much feared by the educators for we expect to find in them the solution of the primitive formation of the sexual impulse the manifestations of the infantile sexuality for reasons which we shall discuss later we will take as a model of the infantile sexual manifestations thumb-sucking pleasure-sucking to which the hungarian pediatrist lindner has devoted an excellent essay thumb-sucking thumb-sucking which manifests itself in the nursing baby and which may be continued till maturity or throughout life consists in a rhythmic repetition of sucking contact with the mouth the lips wherein the purpose of taking nourishment is excluded a part of the lip itself the tongue which is another preferable skin region within reach and even the big toe may be taken as objects for sucking simultaneously there is also a desire to grasp things which manifests itself in a rhythmical pulling of the ear-lobe and which may cause the child to grasp a part of another person generally the ear for the same purpose the pleasure sucking is connected with an entire exhaustion of attention and leads to sleep or even to a motor reaction in the form of an orgasm pleasure sucking is often combined with a rubbing contact with certain sensitive parts of the body such as the breast and external genitals it is by this road that many children go from thumb-sucking to masturbation lindner himself has recognized the sexual nature of this action and openly emphasized it in the nursery thumb-sucking is often treated in the same way as any other sexual naughtiness of the child a very strong objection was raised against this view by many pediatrists and neurologists which in part is certainly due to the confusion of the terms sexual and genital this contradiction raises the difficult question which cannot be rejected namely in what general traits do we wish to recognize the sexual manifestations of the child i believe that the association of the manifestations into which we gained an insight through psychoanalytic investigation justify us in claiming thumb-sucking as a sexual activity and in studying through it the essential features of the infantile sexual activity autoerotism it is our duty here to arrange this state of affairs differently let us insist that the most striking character of this sexual activity is that the impulse is not directed against other persons but that it gratifies itself on its own body to use the happy term invented by havelock ellis we will say that it is autoerotic it is moreover clear that the action of the thumb-sucking child is determined by the fact that it seeks a pleasure which has already been experienced and is now remembered through the rhythmic sucking on a portion of the skin or mucous membrane it finds the gratification in the simplest way it is also easy to conjecture on what occasions the child first experienced this pleasure which it now strives to renew the first and most important activity in the child's life the sucking from the mother's breast or its substitute must have acquainted it with this pleasure we would say that the child's lips behaved like an erogenous zone and that the excitement through the warm stream of milk was really the cause of the pleasurable sensation to be sure the gratification of the erogenous zone was at first united with the gratification of taking nourishment 
he who sees a satiated child sink back from the mother's breast and fall asleep with reddened cheeks and blissful smile will have to admit that this picture remains as typical of the expression of sexual gratification in later life but the desire for repetition of the sexual gratification is separated from the desire for taking nourishment a separation which becomes unavoidable with the appearance of the teeth when the nourishment is no longer sucked in but chewed the child does not make use of a strange object for sucking but prefers its own skin because it is more convenient because it thus makes itself independent of the outer world which it cannot yet control and because in this way it creates for itself as it were a second even if an inferior erogenous zone the inferiority of this second region urges it later to seek the same parts the lips of another person it is a pity that i cannot kiss myself might be attributed to it not all children suck their thumbs it may be assumed that it is found only in children in whom the erogenous significance of the lip zone is constitutionally reinforced children in whom this is retained are habitual kissers as adults and show a tendency to perverse kissing or as men they have a marked desire for drinking and smoking but if repression comes into play they experience disgust for eating and evince hysterical vomiting by virtue of the community of the lip zone the repression encroaches upon the impulse of nourishment many of my female patients showing disturbances in eating such as hysterical globus choking sensations and vomiting have been energetic thumb-suckers during infancy in the thumb-sucking or pleasure-sucking we have already been able to observe the three essential characters of an infantile sexual manifestation the latter has its origin in conjunction with a bodily function which is very important for life it does not yet know any sexual object it is autoerotic and its sexual aim is under the control of an erogenous zone let us assume for the present that these characters also hold true for most of the other activities of the infantile sexual impulse the sexual aim of the infantile sexuality the characters of the erogenous zones from the example of thumb-sucking we may gather a great many points useful for the distinguishing of an erogenous zone it is a portion of skin or mucous membrane in which the stimuli produce a feeling of pleasure of definite quality there is no doubt that the pleasure-producing stimuli are governed by special determinants which we do not know the rhythmic characters must play some part in them and this strongly suggests an analogy to tickling it does not however appear so certain whether the character of the pleasurable feeling evoked by the stimulus can be designated as peculiar and in what part of this peculiarity the sexual factor exists psychology is still groping in the dark when it concerns matters of pleasure and pain and the most cautious assumption is therefore the most advisable we may perhaps later come upon reasons which seem to support the peculiar quality of the sensation of pleasure the erogenous quality may adhere most notably to definite regions of the body as is shown by the example of thumb-sucking there are predestined erogenous zones but the same example also shows that any other region of skin or mucous membrane may assume the function of an erogenous zone it must therefore carry along a certain adaptability the production of the sensation of pleasure therefore depends more on the quality of the stimulus than on the nature of the bodily region the thumb-sucking child looks around on his body and selects any portion of it for pleasure sucking and becoming accustomed to it he then prefers it if he accidentally strikes upon a predestined region such as breast nipple or genitals it naturally has the preference a quite analogous tendency to displacement is again found in the symptomatology of hysteria in this neurosis the repression mostly concerns the genital zones proper these in turn transmit their excitation to the other erogenous zones usually dormant in mature life which then behave exactly like genitals but besides this 
just as in thumb-sucking any other region of the body may become endowed with the excitation of the genitals and raised to an erogenous zone erogenous and hysterogenous zones show the same characters the infantile sexual aim the sexual aim of the infantile impulse consists in the production of gratification through the proper excitation of this or that selected erogenous zone in order to leave a desire for its repetition this gratification must have been previously experienced and we may be sure that nature has devised definite means so as not to leave this occurrence to mere chance the arrangement which has fulfilled this purpose for the lip zone we have already discussed it is the simultaneous connection of this part of the body with the taking of nourishment we shall also meet other similar me mechanisms as sources of sexuality the state of desire for repetition of gratification can be recognized through a peculiar feeling of tension which in itself is rather of a painful character and through a centrally determined feeling of itching or sensitiveness which is projected into the peripheral erogenous zone the sexual aim may therefore be formulated as follows the chief object is to substitute for the projected feeling of sensitiveness in the erogenous zone that outer stimulus which removes the feeling of sensitiveness by evoking the feeling of gratification this external stimulus consists usually in a manipulation which is analogous to sucking it is in full accord with our physiological knowledge if the desire happens to be awakened also peripherally through an actual change in the erogenous zone the action is puzzling only to some extent as one stimulus for its suppression seems to want another applied to the same place End of chapter six section seven the masturbatic sexual manifestations the infantile sexual investigation the sources of infantile sexuality it is a matter of great satisfaction to know that there is nothing further of greater importance to learn about the sexual activity of the child after the impulse of one erogenous zone has become comprehensible to us the most pronounced differences are found in the action necessary for the gratification which consists in sucking for the lip zone and which must be replaced by other muscular actions according to the situation and nature of the other zones the activity of the anal zone like the lip zone the anal zone is through its position adapted to conduct the sexuality to the other functions of the body it should be assumed that the erogenous significance of this region of the body was originally very large through psychoanalysis one finds not without surprise the many transformations that are normally undertaken with the usual excitations emanating from here and that this zone often retains for life a considerable fragment of genital irritability the intestinal catarrhs so frequent during infancy produce intensive irritations in this zone and we often hear it said that intestinal catarrh at this delicate age causes nervousness in later neurotic diseases they exert a definite influence on the symptomatic expression of the neurosis placing at its disposal the whole sum of intestinal disturbances considering the erogenous significance of the anal zone which has been retained at least in transformation one should not laugh at the hemorrhoidal influences to which the old medical literature attached so much weight in the explanation of neurotic states children utilizing the erogenous sensitiveness of the anal zone can be recognized by their holding back of fecal masses until through accumulation there result violent muscular contractions the passage of these masses through the anus is apt to produce a marked irritation of the mucous membrane besides the pain this must produce also a sensation of pleasure one of the surest premonitions of later eccentricity or nervousness is when an infant obstinately refuses to empty his bowel when placed on the chamber by the nurse and reserves this function at its own pleasure 
it does not concern him that he will soil his bed all he cares for is not to lose the subsidiary pleasure while defecating the educators have again the right inkling when they designate children who withhold these functions as bad the content of the bowel which is an exciting object to the sexually sensitive surface of mucous membrane behaves like the precursor of another organ which does not become active until after the phase of childhood in addition it has other important meanings to the nursling it is evidently treated as an additional part of the body it represents the first donation the disposal of which expresses the pliability while the retention of it can express the spite of the little being towards its environment from the idea of donation he later gains the meaning of the babe which according to one of the infantile sexual theories is acquired through eating and is born through the bowel the retention of fecal masses which is at first intentional in order to utilize them as it were for masturbatic excitation of the anal zone is at least one of the roots of constipation so frequent in neuropaths the whole significance of the anal zone is mirrored in the fact that there are but few neurotics but who have not their special scatologic customs ceremonies etc which they retain with cautious secrecy real masturbatic irritation of the anal zone by means of the fingers evoked through either centrally or peripherally supported itching is not at all rare in older children the activity of the genital zone among the erogenous zones of the child's body there is one which certainly does not play the main role and which cannot be the carrier of earliest sexual feeling which however is destined for great things in later life in both male and female it is connected with the voiding of urine penis clitoris and in the former it is enclosed in a sac of mucous membrane probably in order not to miss the irritations caused by the secretions which may arouse the sexual excitement at an early age the sexual activities of this erogenous zone which belongs to the real genitals are the beginning of the later normal sexual life owing to the anatomical position the overflowing of secretions the washing and rubbing of the body and to certain accidental excitements the wandering of intestinal worms in the girl it happens that the pleasurable feeling which these parts of the body are capable of producing makes itself noticeable to the child even during the sucking age and thus awakens desire for its repetition when we review all the actual arrangements and bear in mind that the measures for cleanliness had the same effect as the uncleanliness itself we can then scarcely mistake nature's intention which is to establish the future primacy of these erogenous zones for the sexual activity through the infantile onanism from which hardly an individual escapes the action of removing the stimulus and setting free the gratification consists in a rubbing contiguity with the hand or in a certain previously formed pressure reflex effected by the closure of the thighs the latter procedure seems to be the more primitive and is by far the more common in girls the preference for the hand in boys already indicates what an important part of the male sexual activity will be accomplished in the future by the impulse to mastery the machtigungstribe it can only help towards clearness if i state that the infantile masturbation should be divided into three phases the first phase belongs to the nursing period the second to the short flourishing period of sexual activity at about the fourth year only the third corresponds to the one which is often considered exclusively as onanism of puberty the infantile onanism seems to disappear after a brief time but it may continue uninterruptedly till puberty and thus represent the first marked deviation from the development desirable for civilized man at some time during childhood after the nursing period the sexual impulse of the genitals reawakens and continues active for some time until it is again suppressed or it may continue without interruption 
the possible relations are very diverse and can only be elucidated through a more precise analysis of individual cases the details however of this second infantile sexual activity leave behind the profoundest unconscious impressions in the person's memory if the individual remains healthy they determine his character and if he becomes sick after puberty they determine the symptomatology of his neurosis in the latter case it is found that this sexual period is forgotten and the conscious reminiscences pointing to them are displaced i have already mentioned that i would like to connect the normal infantile amnesia with this infantile sexual activity by psychoanalytic investigation it is possible to bring to consciousness the forgotten material and thereby to remove a compulsion which emanates from the unconscious psychic material the return of the infantile masturbation the sexual excitation of the nursing period returns during the designated years of childhood as a centrally determined tickling sensation demanding onanistic gratification or as a pollution-like process which analogous to the pollution of maturity may attain gratification without the aid of any action the latter case is more frequent in girls and in the second half of childhood its determinants are not well understood but it often though not regularly seems to have as a basis a period of early active onanism the symptomatology of this sexual manifestation is poor the genital apparatus is still undeveloped and all signs are therefore displayed by the urinary apparatus which is so to say the guardian of the genital apparatus most of the so-called bladder disturbances of this period are of a sexual nature whenever the enuresis nocturna does not represent an epileptic attack it corresponds to a pollution the return of the sexual activity is determined by inner and outer causes which can be conjectured from the formation of the symptoms of neurotic diseases and definitely revealed by psychoanalytic investigations the internal causes will be discussed later the accidental outer causes attain at this time a great and permanent significance as the first outer cause we have the influence of seduction which prematurely treats the child as a sexual object under conditions favoring impressions this teaches the child the gratification of the genital zones and thus usually forces it to repeat this gratification in onanism such influences can come from adults or other children i cannot admit that i overestimated its frequency or its significance in my contributions to the etiology of hysteria though i did not know then that normal individuals may have the same experiences in their childhood and hence placed a higher value on seductions than on the factors found in the sexual constitution and development it is quite obvious that no seduction is necessary to awaken the sexual life of the child that such an awakening may come on spontaneously from inner sources polymorphous perverse disposition it is instructive to know that under the influence of seduction the child may become polymorphous perverse and may be misled into all sorts of transgressions this goes to show that it carries along the adaptation for them in its disposition the formation of such perversions meets but slight resistance because the psychic dams against sexual transgressions such as shame loathing and morality which depend on the age of the child are not yet erected or are only in the process of formation in this respect the child perhaps does not behave differently from the average uncultured woman in whom the same polymorphous perverse disposition exists such a woman may remain sexually normal under usual conditions but under the guidance of a clever seducer she will find pleasure in every perversion and will retain the same as her sexual activity the same polymorphous or infantile disposition fits the prostitute for her professional activity and in the enormous number of prostitutes and of women to whom we must attribute an adaptation for prostitution even if they do not follow this calling it is absolutely impossible not to recognize in their uniform disposition for all perversions the universal and primitive human partial impulses 
for the rest the influence of seduction does not aid us in unravelling the original relations of the sexual impulse but rather confuses our understanding of the same inasmuch as it prematurely supplies the child with the sexual object at a time when the infantile sexual impulse does not yet evince any desire for it we must admit however that the infantile sexual life though mainly under the control of erogenous zones also shows components in which from the very beginning other persons are regarded as sexual objects among these we have the impulses for looking and showing off and for cruelty which manifest themselves somewhat independently of the erogenous zones and which only later enter into intimate relationship with the sexual life but along with the erogenous sexual activity they are noticeable even in the infantile years as separate and independent strivings the little child is above all shameless and during its early years it evinces definite pleasure in displaying its body and especially its sexual organs a counterpart to this desire which is to be considered as perverse the curiosity to see other persons genitals probably appears first in the later years of childhood when the hindrance of the feeling of shame has already reached a certain development under the influence of seduction the looking perversion may attain great importance for the sexual life of the child still from my investigations of the childhood years of normal and neurotic patients i must conclude that the impulse for looking can appear in the child as a spontaneous sexual manifestation small children whose attention has once been directed to their own genitals usually by masturbation are wont to progress in this direction without outside interference and to develop a vivid interest in the genitals of their playmates as the occasion for the gratification of such curiosity is generally afforded during the gratification of both excrementitious needs such children become voyeurs and are zealous spectators at the voiding of urine and feces of others after this tendency has been repressed the curiosity to see the genitals of others one's own or those of the other sex remains as a tormenting desire which in some neurotic cases furnishes the strongest motive power for the formation of symptoms the cruelty component of the sexual impulse develops in the child with still greater independence of those sexual activities which are connected with erogenous zones cruelty is especially near the childish character since the inhibition which restrains the impulse to mastery before it causes pain to others that is the capacity for sympathy develops comparatively late as we know a thorough psychological analysis of this impulse has not as yet been successfully accomplished we may assume that the cruel feelings emanate from the impulse to mastery and appear at a period in the sexual life before the genitals have taken on their later role it then dominates a phase of the sexual life which we shall later describe as the pregenital organization children who are distinguished for evincing especial cruelty to animals and playmates may be justly suspected of intensive and premature sexual activity in the erogenous zones and in a simultaneous prematurity of all sexual impulses the erogenous sexual activity surely seems to be primary the absence of the barrier of sympathy carries with it the danger that the connections between cruelty and the erogenous impulses formed in childhood cannot be broken in later life an erogenous source of the passive impulse for cruelty masochism is found in the painful irritation of the gluteal region which is familiar to all educators since the confessions of j j rousseau this has justly caused them to demand that physical punishment which usually concerns this part of the body should be withheld from all children in whom the libido might be forced into collateral roads by the later demands of cultural education the infantile sexual investigation inquisitiveness at the same time when the sexual life of the child reaches its first bloom from the age of three to the age of five it also evinces the beginning of that activity which is ascribed to the impulse for knowledge and investigation the desire for knowledge can neither be added to the elementary components of the impulses nor can it be altogether subordinated under sexuality 
its activity corresponds on the one hand to a sublimating mode of acquisition and on the other hand it labours with the energy of the desire for looking its relations to the sexual life however are of particular importance for we have learned from psychoanalysis that the inquisitiveness of children is attracted to the sexual problems unusually early and in an unexpectedly intensive manner indeed it perhaps may first be awakened by the sexual problems the riddle of the sphinx it is not theoretical but practical interests which start the work of the investigation activity in the child the threat to the conditions of his existence through the actual or expected arrival of a new child the fear of the loss in care and love which is connected with this event cause the child to become thoughtful and sagacious corresponding with the history of this awakening the first problem with which it occupies itself is not the question as to the difference between the sexes but the riddle from where do children come in a distorted form which can easily be unravelled this is the same riddle which was given by the theban sphinx the fact of the two sexes is usually first accepted by the child without struggle and hesitation it is quite natural for the male child to presuppose in all persons it knows a genital like his own and to find it impossible to harmonize the lack of it with his conception of others the castration complex this conviction is energetically adhered to by the boy and tenaciously defended against the contradictions which soon result and are only given up after severe internal struggles castration complex the substitutive formations of this lost penis of the woman play a great part in the formation of many perversions the assumption of the same male genital in all persons is the first of the remarkable and consequential infantile sexual theories it is of little help to the child when biological science agrees with his preconceptions and recognizes the feminine clitoris as the real substitute for the penis the little girl does not react with similar refusals when she sees the differently formed genital of the boy she is immediately prepared to recognize it and soon becomes envious of the penis this envy reaches its highest point in the consequentially important wish that she also should be a boy birth theories many people can remember distinctly how intensely they interested themselves in the prepubescent period in the question where children came from the anatomical solutions at that time read very differently the children come out of the breast or are cut out of the body or the navel opens itself to let them out outside of analysis one only seldom remembers the investigation corresponding to the early childhood years it had long merged into repression but its results were thoroughly uniform one gets children by eating something special as in the fairy tale and they are born through the bowel like a passage these infantile theories recall the structures in the animal kingdom especially do they recall the cloaca of the types which stand lower than the mammals sadistic conception of the sexual act if children of so delicate an age become spectators of the sexual act between grown-ups for which an occasion is furnished by the conviction of the grown-ups that little children cannot understand anything sexual they cannot help conceiving the sexual act as a kind of maltreating or overpowering that is it impresses them in a sadistic sense psychoanalysis also teaches us that such an early childhood impression contributes much to the disposition for a later sadistic displacement of the sexual aim besides this children also occupy themselves with the problem of what the sexual act consists in or as they grasp it of what marriage consists and seek the solution of the mystery mostly in an association to which the functions of urination and defecation give occasion the typical failure of the infantile sexual investigation it can be stated in general about the infantile sexual theories that they are reproductions of the child's own sexual constitution and that despite their grotesque mistakes they evince more understanding of the sexual processes than is credited to their creators children also perceive the pregnancy of the mother and know how to interpret it correctly the stork fable is very often related before auditors who confront it with a deep but mostly mute suspicion but as two elements remain unknown to the infantile sexual investigation 
namely the role of the propagating semen and the female genital opening precisely the same points in which the infantile organization is still backward the effort of the infantile investigator regularly remains fruitless and ends in a renunciation which, which not infrequently leaves a lasting injury to the desire for knowledge the sexual investigation of these early childhood years is always conducted alone it signifies the first step towards independent orientation in the world and causes a marked estrangement between the child and the persons of his environment who formerly enjoyed its full confidence the phases of development of the sexual organization as characteristics of the infantile sexuality we have hitherto emphasized the fact that it is essentially autoerotic it finds its object in its own body and that its individual partial impulses which on the whole are unconnected and independent of one another are striving for the acquisition of pleasure the end of this development forms the so-called normal sexual life of the adult in which the acquisition of pleasure has been put into the service of the function of propagation and the partial impulses under the primacy of one single erogenous zone have formed a firm organization for the attainment of the sexual aim in a strange sexual object pregenital organizations the study with the help of psychoanalysis of the inhibitions and disturbances in this course of development now permits us to recognize additions and primary stages of such organization of the partial impulses which likewise furnish a sort of sexual regime these phases of the sexual organization normally will pass over smoothly and will only be recognizable by slight indications only in pathological cases do they become active and discernible to coarse observation organizations of the sexual life in which the genital zones have not yet assumed the dominating role we would call the pregenital phase so far we have become acquainted with two of them which recall reversions to early animal states one of the first of such pregenital sexual organizations is the oral or if we wish the cannibalistic here the sexual activity is not yet separated from the taking of nourishment and the contrasts within the same not yet differentiated the object of the one activity is also that of the other the sexual aim consists in the incorporating into one's own body of the object it is the prototype of that which later plays such an important psychic role as identification as a remnant of this fictitious phase of organization forced on us by pathology we can consider thumb-sucking here the sexual activity became separated from the nourishment activity and the strange object was given up in favor of one from his own body a second pregenital phase is the sadistic anal organization here the contrasts which run through the whole sexual life are already developed but cannot yet be designated as masculine and feminine but must be called active and passive the activity is supplied by the musculature of the body through the mastery impulse the erogenous mucous membrane of the bowel manifests itself above all as an organ with a passive sexual aim for both strivings there are objects present which however do not merge together besides them there are other partial impulses which are active in an autoerotic manner the sexual polarity and the strange object can thus already be demonstrated in this phase the organization and subordination under the function of propagation are still lacking ambivalence this form of the sexual organization could be retained throughout life and continue to draw to itself a large part of the sexual activity the prevalence of sadism and the role of the cloaca of the anal zone stamps it with an exquisitely archaic impression as another characteristic belonging to it we can mention the fact that the contrasting pair of impulses are developed in almost the same manner a behavior which was designated by bleuler with the happy name of ambivalence the assumption of the pregenital organizations of the sexual life is based on the analysis of the neuroses and hardly deserves any consideration without a knowledge of the same we may expect that continued analytic efforts will furnish us with still more disclosures concerning the structure and development of the normal sexual function 
to complete the picture of the infantile sexual life one must add that frequently or regularly an object selection takes place even in childhood which is as characteristic as the one we have represented for the phase of development of puberty this object selection proceeds in such a manner that all the sexual strivings proceed in the direction of one person in whom they wish to attain their aim this is then the nearest approach to the definitive formation of the sexual life after puberty that is possible in childhood it differs from the latter only in the fact that the collection of the partial impulses and their subordination to the primacy of the genitals is very imperfectly or not at all accomplished in childhood the establishment of this primacy in the service of propagation is therefore the last phase through which the sexual organization passes the two periods of object selection that the object selection takes place in two periods or in two shifts can be spoken of as a typical occurrence the first shift has its origin between the age of three and five years and is brought to a stop or to retrogression by the latency period it is characterized by the infantile nature of its sexual aims the second shift starts with puberty and determines the definitive formation of the sexual life the fact of the double object selection which is essentially due to the effect of the latency period becomes most significant for the disturbance of this terminal state the results of the infantile object selection reach into the later period they are either preserved as such or are even refreshed at the time of puberty but due to the development of the repression which takes place between the two phases they turn out as unutilizable the sexual aims have become softened and now represent what we can designate as the tender streams of the sexual life only psychoanalytic investigation can demonstrate that behind this tenderness such as honoring and esteeming there is concealed the old sexual strivings of the infantile partial impulses which have now become useless the object selection of the pubescent period must renounce the infantile objects and begin anew as a sensuous stream the fact that the two streams do not meet often enough has as a result that one of the ideals of the sexual life namely the union of all desires in one object cannot be attained the sources of the infantile sexuality in our effort to follow up the origins of the sexual impulse we have thus far found that the sexual excitement originates a as an imitation of a gratification which has been experienced in conjunction with other organic processes b through the appropriate peripheral stimulation of erogenous zones c as an expression of some impulse like the looking and cruelty impulses the origin of which we do not yet fully understand the psychoanalytic investigation of later life which leads back to childhood and the contemporary observation of the child itself cooperate to reveal to us still other regularly flowing sources of the sexual excitement the observation of childhood has the disadvantage of treating easily misunderstood material while psychoanalysis is made difficult by the fact that it can reach its objects and conclusions only by great detours still the united efforts of both methods achieve a sufficient degree of positive understanding in investigating the erogenous zones we have already found that these skin regions merely show the special exaggeration of a form of sensitiveness which is to a certain degree found over the whole surface of the skin it will therefore not surprise us to learn that certain forms of general sensitiveness in the skin can be ascribed to very distinct erogenous action among these we will above all mention the temperature sensitiveness this will perhaps prepare us for the understanding of the therapeutic effects of warm baths mechanical excitation we must moreover describe here the production of sexual excitation by means of rhythmic mechanical shaking of the body there are three kinds of exciting influences those acting on the sensory apparatus of the vestibular nerves those acting on the skin and those acting on the deep parts such as the muscles and joints the sexual excitation produced by these influences seems to be of a pleasurable nature 
it is worth emphasizing that for some time we shall continue to use indiscriminately the term sexual excitement and gratification leaving the search for an explanation of the terms to a later time and that the pleasure is produced by mechanical stimulation is proved by the fact that children are so fond of play involving passive motion like swinging or flying in the air and repeatedly demand its repetition as we know rocking is regularly used in putting restless children to sleep the shaking sensation experienced in wagons and railroad trains exerts such a fascinating influence on older children that all boys at least at one time in their lives want to become conductors and drivers they all want to ascribe to railroad activities an extraordinary and mysterious interest and during the age of fantastic activity shortly before puberty they utilize these as a nucleus for exquisite sexual symbolism the desire to connect railroad traveling with sexuality apparently originates from the pleasurable character of the sensation of motion when the repression later sets in and changes so many of the childish likes into their opposites these same persons as adolescents and adults then react to the rocking and rolling with nausea and become terribly exhausted by a railroad journey or they show a tendency to attacks of anxiety during the journey and by becoming obsessed with railroad phobia they protect themselves against a repetition of the painful experiences this also fits in with the not as yet understood fact that the concurrence of fear with mechanical shaking produces the severest hysterical forms of traumatic neurosis it may at least be assumed that inasmuch as even a slight intensity of these influences becomes a source of sexual excitement the action of an excessive amount of the same will produce a profound disorder in the sexual mechanism muscular activity it is well known that the child has need for strong muscular activity from the gratification of which it draws extraordinary pleasure whether this pleasure has anything to do with sexuality whether it includes in itself sexual satisfaction or can be the occasion of sexual excitement all this may be refuted by critical consideration which will probably be directed also to the position taken above that the pleasure in the sensation of passive movement are of sexual character or that they are sexually exciting the fact remains however that a number of persons report that they experience the first signs of excitement in their genitals during fighting or wrestling with playmates in which situation besides the general muscular exertion there is an intensive contact with the opponent's skin which also becomes effective the desire for muscular contest with a definite person like the desire for word contest in later years is a good sign that the object selection has been directed toward this person was sick leibt das neck sick in the promotion of sexual excitement through muscular activity we might recognize one of the sources of the sadistic impulse the infantile connection between fighting and sexual excitement acts in many persons as a determinant for the future preferred course of their sexual impulse affective processes the other sources of sexual excitement in the child are open to less doubt through contemporary observations as well as through later investigations it is easy to ascertain that all more intensive affective processes even excitements of a terrifying nature encroach upon sexuality this can at all events furnish us with a contribution to the understanding of the pathogenic action of such emotions in the school child fear of a coming examination or exertion expended in the solution of a difficult task can become significant for the breaking through of sexual manifestations as well as for his relations to the school inasmuch as under such excitements a sensation often occurs urging him to touch the genitals or leading to a pollution-like process with all its disagreeable consequences the behavior of children at school which is so often mysterious to the teacher ought surely to be considered in relation with their germinating sexuality the sexually exciting influence of some painful effects such as fear shuddering and horror is felt by a great many people throughout life and readily explains why so many seek opportunities to experience such sensations provided that certain accessory circumstances as under imaginary circumstances in reading or in, in the theatre suppress the earnestness of the painful feeling if we might assume that the same erogenous action also reaches the intensive 
painful feelings especially if the pain be toned down or held at a distance by a subsidiary determination this relation would then contain the main roots of the masochistic sadistic impulse into the manifold composition of which we are gaining a gradual insight intellectual work finally it is evident that mental application or the concentration of attention on an intellectual accomplishment will result especially often in youthful persons but in older persons as well in a simultaneous sexual excitement which may be looked upon as the only justified basis for the otherwise so doubtful etiology of nervous disturbances from mental overwork if we now in conclusion review the evidences and indications of the sources of the infantile sexual excitement which have been reported neither completely nor exhaustively we may lay down the following general laws as suggested or established it seems to be provided in the most generous manner that the process of sexual excitement the nature of which certainly remains quite mysterious to us should be set in motion the factor making this provision in a more or less direct way is the excitation of the sensible surfaces of the skin and sensory organs while the most immediate exciting influences are exerted on certain parts which are designated as erogenous zones the criterion in all these sources of sexual excitement is really the quality of the stimuli though the factor of intensity in pain is not entirely unimportant but in addition to this there are arrangements in the organism which induce sexual excitement as a subsidiary action in a large number of inner processes as soon as the intensity of these processes has risen above certain quantitative limits what we have designated as the partial impulses of sexuality are either directly derived from these inner sources of sexual excitation or composed of contributions from such sources and from erogenous zones it is possible that nothing of any considerable significance occurs in the organism that does not contribute its components to the excitement of the sexual impulse it seems to me at present impossible to shed more light and certainty on these general propositions and for this i hold two factors responsible first the novelty of this manner of investigation and secondly the fact that the nature of the sexual excitement is entirely unfamiliar to us nevertheless i will not forbear speaking about two points which promise to open wide prospects in the future diverse sexual constitutions a we have considered above the possibility of establishing the manifold character of congenital sexual constitutions through the diverse formation of the erogenous zones we may now attempt to do the same in dealing with the indirect sources of sexual excitement we may assume that although these different sources furnish contributions in all individuals they are not all equally strong in all persons and that a further contribution to the differentiation of the diverse sexual constitution will be found in the preferred developments of the individual sources of sexual excitement the paths of opposite influences b since we are now dropping the figurative manner of expression hitherto employed by which we spoke of sources of sexual excitement we may now assume that all the connecting ways leading from other functions to sexuality must also be passable in the reverse direction for example if the lip zone the common possession of both functions is responsible for the fact that the sexual gratification originates during the taking of nourishment the same factor offers also an explanation for the disturbances in the taking of nourishment if the erogenous functions of the common zone are disturbed as soon as we know that concentration of attention may produce sexual excitement it is quite natural to assume that acting on the same path but in a contrary direction the state of sexual excitement will be able to influence the availability of the voluntary attention a good part of the systematology of the neuroses which i trace to disturbance of sexual processes manifests itself in disturbances of the other non-sexual bodily functions and this hitherto incomprehensible action becomes less mysterious if it only represents the counterpart of the influences controlling the production of the sexual excitement however the same paths through which sexual disturbances encroach upon the other functions of the body must in health be supposed to serve another important function 
it must be through these paths that the attraction of the sexual motive powers to other than sexual aims the sublimation of sexuality is accomplished we must conclude with the admission that very little is definitely known concerning the paths beyond the fact that they exist and that they are probably passable in both directions end of section seven this is books on my mind youtube channel listen to world's best and high quality audiobooks chapter eight essay three the transformation of puberty the primacy of the genital zones and the four pleasure the problem of sexual excitement essay three the transformation of puberty with the beginning of puberty the changes set in which transform the infantile sexual life into its definite normal form hitherto the sexual impulse has been preponderantly autoerotic it now finds the sexual object thus far it has manifested itself in single impulses and in erogenous zones seeking a certain pleasure as a single sexual aim a new sexual aim now appears for the production of which all partial impulses cooperate while the erogenous zones subordinate themselves to the primacy of the genital zone as the new sexual aim assigns very different functions to the two sexes their sexual developments now part company the sexual development of the man is more consistent and easier to understand while in the woman there even appears a form of regression the normality of the sexual life is guaranteed only by the exact concurrence of the two streams directed to the sexual object and sexual aim it is like the piercing of a tunnel from opposite sides the new sexual aim in the man consists in the discharging of the sexual products it is not contradictory to the former sexual aim that of obtaining pleasure on the contrary the highest amount of pleasure is connected with this final act in the sexual process the sexual impulse now enters into the service of the function of propagation it becomes so to say altruistic if this transformation is to succeed its process must be adjusted to the original dispositions and all the peculiarities of the impulses just as on every other occasion where new connections and compositions are to be formed in complicated mechanisms here too there is a possibility for morbid disturbance if the new order of things does not get itself established all morbid disturbances of the sexual life may justly be considered as inhibitions of development the primacy of the genital zones and the fore pleasure from the course of development as described we can clearly see the issue and the end aim the intermediary transitions are still quite obscure and many a riddle will have to be solved in them the most striking process of puberty has been selected as its most characteristic it is the manifest growth of the external genitals which have shown a relative inhibition of growth during the latency period of childhood simultaneously the inner genitals develop to such an extent as to be able to furnish sexual products or to receive them for the purpose of forming a new living being a most complicated apparatus is thus formed which waits to be claimed this apparatus can be set in motion by stimuli and observation teaches that the stimuli can affect it in three ways from the outer world through the familiar erogenous zones from the inner organic world by ways still to be investigated and from the psychic life which merely represents a depository of external impressions and a receptacle of inner excitations the same result follows in all three cases namely a state which can be designated as sexual excitation and which manifests itself in psychic and somatic signs the psychic sign consists in a peculiar feeling of tension of a most urgent character and among the manifold somatic signs the many changes in the genitals stand first they have a definite meaning that of readiness they constitute a preparation for the sexual act the erection of the penis and the glandular activity of the vagina 
the sexual tension the character of the tension of sexual excitation is connected with a problem the solution of which is as difficult as it would be important for the conception of the sexual process despite all divergence of opinion regarding it in psychology i must firmly maintain that a feeling of tension must carry with it the character of displeasure for me it is conclusive that such a feeling carries with it the impulse to alter the psychic situation and acts incitingly which is quite contrary to the nurture of perceived pleasure but if we ascribe the tension of the sexual excitation to the feelings of displeasure we encounter the fact that it is undoubtedly pleasurably perceived the tension produced by sexual excitation is everywhere accompanied by pleasure even in the preparatory changes of the genitals there is a distinct feeling of satisfaction what relation is there between this unpleasant tension and this feeling of pleasure everything relating to the problem of pleasure and pain touches one of the weakest spots of present-day psychology we shall try if possible to learn something from the determinations of the case in question and to avoid encroaching on the problem as a whole let us first glance at the manner in which the erogenous zones adjust themselves to the new order of things an important role devolves upon them in the preparation of the sexual excitation the eye which is very remote from the sexual object is most often in position during the relations of object wooing to become attracted by that particular quality of excitation the motive of which we designate as beauty in the sexual object the excellencies of the sexual object are therefore also called attractions this attraction is on the one hand already connected with pleasure and on the other hand it either results in an increase of the sexual excitation or in an evocation of the same where it is still wanting the effect is the same if the excitation of another erogenous zone for example the touching hand is added to it there is on the one hand the feeling of pleasure which soon becomes enhanced by the pleasure from the preparatory changes and on the other hand there is a further increase of the sexual tension which soon changes into a most distinct feeling of displeasure if it cannot proceed to more pleasure another case will perhaps be clearer let us for example take the case where an erogenous zone like a woman's breast is excited by touching in a person who is not sexually excited at that time this touching in itself evokes a feeling of pleasure but it is also best adapted to awaken sexual excitement which demands still more pleasure how it happens that the perceived pleasure evokes the desire for greater pleasure that is the real problem for pleasure mechanism but the role which devolves upon the erogenous zones is clear what applies to one applies to all they are all utilized to furnish a certain amount of pleasure through their own proper excitation which increases the tension and which is in turn destined to produce the necessary motor energy in order to bring to a conclusion the sexual act the last part but one of this act is again a suitable excitation of an erogenous zone that is the genital zone proper of the glans penis is excited by the object most fit for it the mucous membrane of the vagina and through the pleasure furnished by this excitation it now produces reflexly the motor energy which conveys to the surface the sexual substance this last pleasure is highest in its intensity and differs from the earliest ones in its mechanism it is altogether produced through discharge it is altogether gratification pleasure and the tension of the libido temporarily dies away with it it does not seem to me unjustified to fix by name the distinction in the nature of these pleasures the one through the excitation of the erogenous zones and the other through the discharge of the sexual substance in contradistinction to the end pleasure or pleasure of gratification of sexual activity we can properly designate the first as for pleasure the for pleasure is then the same as that furnished by the infantile sexual impulse though on a reduced scale 
while the end pleasure is new and is probably connected with determinations which appear first at puberty the formula for the new function of the erogenous zones reads as follows they are utilized for the purpose of making possible the production of the greater pleasure of gratification by means of the forepleasure which is gained from them as in infantile life i have recently been able to elucidate another example from a quite different realm of the psychic life in which likewise a greater feeling of pleasure is achieved by means of a lesser feeling of pleasure which thereby acts as an alluring premium we had there also the opportunity of entering more deeply into the nature of pleasure dangers of the forepleasure however the connection of forepleasure with the infantile life is strengthened by the pathogenic role which may devolve upon it in the mechanism through which the forepleasure is expressed there exists an obvious danger to the attainment of the normal sexual aim this occurs if it happens that there is too much forepleasure and too little tension in any part of the preparatory sexual process the motive power for the further continuation of the sexual process then escapes the whole road becomes shortened and the preparatory action in question takes the place of the normal sexual aim experience shows that such a hurtful condition is determined by the fact that the erogenous zone concerned or the corresponding partial impulse has already contributed an unusual amount of pleasure in infantile life if other factors favoring fixation are added a compulsion readily results for the later life which prevents the forepleasure from arranging itself into a new combination indeed the mechanism of many perversions is of such a nature they merely represent a lingering at the preparatory act of the sexual process the failure of the function of the sexual mechanism through the fault of the forepleasure is generally avoided if the primacy of the genital zones has also already been sketched out in infantile life the preparations of the second half of childhood from the eighth year to puberty really seem to favor this during these years the genital zones behave almost as at the age of maturity they are the seat of exciting sensations and of preparatory changes if any kind of pleasure is experienced through the gratification of other erogenous zones although this effect remains aimless that is it contributes nothing towards the continuation of the sexual process besides the pleasure of gratification a certain amount of sexual tension appears even in infancy though it is less constant and less abundant we can now understand also why in the discussion of the sources of sexuality we had a perfectly good reason for saying that the process in question acts as sexual gratification as well as sexual excitement we note that on our way towards the truth we have at first enormously exaggerated the distinctions between the infantile and the mature sexual life and we therefore supplement what has been said with a correction the infantile manifestations of sexuality determine not only the deviations from the normal sexual life but also the normal formations of the same the problem of sexual excitement it remains entirely unexplained whence the sexual tension comes which originates simultaneously with the gratification of erogenous zones and what is its nature the obvious supposition that this tension originates in some way from the pleasure itself is not only improbable in itself but untenable inasmuch as during the greatest pleasure which is connected with the voiding of sexual substance there is no production of tension but rather a removal of all tension hence pleasure and sexual tension can be only indirectly connected the role of the sexual substance aside from the fact that only the discharge of the sexual substance can normally put an end to the sexual excitement there are other essential facts which bring the sexual tension into relation with the sexual products in a life of continence the sexual activity is wont to discharge the sexual substance at night during pleasurable dream hallucinations of a sexual act this discharge coming at changing but not at entirely capricious intervals 
and the following interpretation of this process, the nocturnal pollution, can hardly be rejected, that is, that the sexual tension which brings about a substitute for the sexual act by the short hallucinatory road is a function of the accumulated semen in the reservoirs for the sexual products. Experiences with the exhaustibility of the sexual mechanism speak for the same thing. Where there is no stock of semen, it is not only impossible to accomplish the sexual act, but there is also a lack of excitability in the erogenous zones, the suitable excitation of which can evoke no pleasure. We thus discover incidentally that a certain amount of sexual tension is itself necessary for the excitability of the erogenous zones. One would thus be forced to the assumption, which, if I am not mistaken, is quite generally adopted, that the accumulation of sexual substance produces and maintains the sexual tension. The pressure of these products on the walls of their receptacles acts as an excitant on the spinal centre, the state of which is then perceived by the higher centres, which then produce in consciousness the familiar feeling of tension. If the excitation of erogenous zones increases the sexual tension, it can only be due to the fact that the erogenous zones are connected with these centres by previously formed anatomical connections. They increase there the tone of the excitation, and with sufficient sexual tension they set in motion the sexual act, and with insufficient tension they merely stimulate a production of the sexual substance. The weakness of the theory which one finds adopted, for example in von Kraft Ebing's description of the sexual process, lies in the fact that it has been formed for the sexual activity of the mature man and pays too little heed to three kinds of relations which should also have been elucidated. We refer to the relations as found in the child, in the woman, and in the castrated male. In none of the three cases can we speak of an accumulation of sexual products in the same sense as in the man, which naturally renders difficult the general application of this scheme. Still, it may be admitted without any further ado that ways can be found to justify the subordination of even these cases. Nevertheless, one should be cautious about burdening the factor of accumulation of sexual products with actions which it seems incapable of supporting. Overestimation of the internal genitals that sexual excitement can be independent to a considerable extent of the production of sexual substance seems to be shown by observations on castrated males, in whom the libido sometimes escapes the injury caused by the operation, although the opposite behaviour, which is really the motive for the operation, is usually the rule. It is therefore not at all surprising, as C. Rieger puts it, that the loss of the male germ glands in maturer age should exert no new influence on the psychic life of the individual. The germ glands are really not the sexuality, and the experience with castrated males only verifies what we had long before learned from the removal of the ovaries, namely that it is impossible to do away with the sexual character by removing the germ glands. To be sure, castration performed at a tender age, before puberty, comes nearer to this aim, but it would seem in this case that besides the loss of the sexual glands, we must also consider the inhibition of development and other factors which are connected with that loss. Chemical Theories The truth remains, however, that we are unable to give any information about the nature of the sexual excitement for the reason that we do not know with what organ or organs sexuality is connected, since we have seen that the sexual glands have been overestimated in this significance. Since surprising discoveries have taught us the important role of the thyroid gland in sexuality, we may assume that the knowledge of the essential factors of sexuality are still withheld from us. One who feels the need of filling up the large gap in our knowledge with a preliminary assumption may formulate for himself the following theory based on the active substances found in the thyroid. Through the appropriate excitement of erogenous zones as well as through other conditions under which sexual excitement originates, a material which is universally distributed in the organism becomes disintegrated, 
the decomposing products of which supply a specific stimulus to the organs of reproduction or to the spinal centre connected with them. Such a transformation of a toxic stimulus in a particular organic stimulus we are already familiar with from other toxic products introduced into the body from without. To treat, if only hypothetically, the complexities of the pure toxic and the physiological stimulations which result in the sexual processes is not now our appropriate task. To be sure, I attach no value to this special assumption, and I shall be quite ready to give it up in favour of another, provided its original character, the emphasis on the sexual chemism, were preserved. For this apparently arbitrary statement is supported by a fact which, though little heeded, is most noteworthy. The neuroses which can be traced only to disturbances of the sexual life show the greatest clinical resemblance to the phenomena of intoxication and abstinence which result from the habitual introduction of pleasure-producing poisonous substances, alkaloids. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 The Theory of the Libido Differentiation between Man and Woman The Object Finding The Theory of the Libido these assumptions concerning the chemical basis of the sexual excitement are in full accord with the auxiliary conception which we formed for the purpose of mastering the psychic manifestations of the sexual life. We have determined the concept of libido as that of a force of variable quantity which has the capacity of measuring processes and transformations in the spheres of sexual excitement. This libido we distinguished from the energy which is to be generally adjudged to the psychic processes with reference to its special origin, and thus we attribute to it also a qualitative character. In separating libidinous from other psychic energy, we give expression to the assumption that the sexual processes of the organism are differentiated from the nutritional processes through a special chemism. The analysis of perversions and psychoneuroses have taught us that this sexual excitement is furnished not only from the so-called sexual parts alone, but from all organs of the body. We thus formulate for ourselves the concept of a libido quantum, whose psychic representative we designate as the ego libido, the production, increase, distribution and displacement of this ego libido, will offer the possible explanation for the observed psychosexual phenomena. But this ego libido becomes conveniently accessible to psychoanalytic study only when the psychic energy is employed on sexual objects, that is, when it becomes object libido. Then we see it as it concentrates and fixes itself on objects, or as it leaves those objects and passes over to others from which positions it directs the individual's sexual activity, that is, it leads to partial and temporary extinction of the libido. Psychoanalysis of the so-called transference neurosis, hysteria and compulsion neurosis, offers us here a reliable insight. Concerning the fates of the object libido, we also state that it is withdrawn from the object, that it is preserved floating in special states of tension, and is finally taken back into the ego, so that it again becomes ego libido. In contradistinction to the object libido, we also call the ego libido narcissistic libido. From psychoanalysis we look over the boundary which we are not permitted to pass into the activity of the narcissistic libido and thus form an idea of the relations between the two. The narcissistic or ego libido appears to us as the great reservoir from which the energy for the investment of the object is sent out and into which it is drawn back again while the narcissistic libido investment of the ego appears to us as the realized primitive state in the first childhood, which only becomes hidden by the later emissions of the libido and is retained at the bottom behind them. The task of a theory of libido of neurotic and psychotic disturbances would have for its object to express in terms of the libido economy all observed phenomena and disclosed processes. 
it is easy to divine that the greater significance would attach thereby to the destinies of the ego libido especially where it would be the question of explaining the deeper psychotic disturbances the difficulty then lies in the fact that the means of our investigation psychoanalysis at present gives us definite information only concerning the transformation of the object libido but cannot distinguish without further study the ego libido from the other effective energies in the ego differentiation between man and woman it is known that the sharp differentiation of the male and female character originates at puberty and it is the resulting difference which more than any other factor decisively influences the later development of personality to be sure the male and female dispositions are easily recognizable even in infantile life thus the development of sexual inhibitions shame loathing sympathy etc ensues earlier and with less resistance in the little girl than in the little boy the tendency to sexual repression certainly seems much greater and where partial impulses of sexuality are noticed they show a preference for the passive form but the autoerotic activity of the erogenous zones is the same in both sexes and it is this agreement that removes the possibility of a sex differentiation in childhood as it appears after puberty in respect to the autoerotic and masturbatic sexual manifestations it may be asserted that the sexuality of the little girl has entirely a male character indeed if one could give a more definite content to the terms masculine and feminine one might advance the opinion that the libido is regularly and lawfully of a masculine nature whether in the man or in the woman and if we consider its object this may be either the man or the woman since becoming acquainted with the aspect of bisexuality i hold this factor as here decisive and i believe that without taking into account the factor of bisexuality it will hardly be possible to understand the actually observed sexual manifestations in man and woman the leading zones in man and woman further than this i can only add the following the chief erogenous zone in the female child is the clitoris which is homologous to the male penis all i have been able to discover concerning masturbation in little girls concerned the clitoris and not those other external genitals which are so important for the later sexual functions with few exceptions i myself doubt whether the female child can be seduced to anything but clitoris masturbation the frequent spontaneous discharges of sexual excitement in little girls manifest themselves in a twitching of the clitoris and its frequent erections enable the girl to understand correctly even without any instruction the sexual manifestations of the other sex they simply transfer to the boys the sensation of their own sexual processes if one wishes to understand how the little girl becomes a woman he must follow up the further destinies of this clitoris excitation puberty which brings to the boy a great advance of libido distinguishes itself in the girl by a new wave of repression which especially concerns the clitoris sexuality it is a part of the male sexual life that sinks into repression the reinforcement of the sexual inhibitions produced in the woman by the repression of puberty causes a stimulus in the libido of the man and forces it to increase its capacity with the height of the libido there is a rise in the overestimation of the sexual which can be present in its full force only when the woman refuses and denies her sexuality if the sexual act is finally submitted to and the clitoris becomes excited its role is then to conduct the excitement to the adjacent female parts and in this it acts like a chip of pine wood which is utilized to set fire to the harder wood it often takes some time for this transference to be accomplished during which the young wife remains anaesthetic this anesthesia may become permanent if the clitoris zone refuses to give up its excitability a condition brought on by abundant activities in infantile life 
it is known that anesthesia in women is often only apparent and local they are anesthetic at the vaginal entrance but not at all unexcitable through the clitoris or even through other zones besides these erogenous causes of anesthesia there are also psychic causes likewise determined by the repression if the transference of the erogenous excitability from the clitoris to the vagina has succeeded the woman has thus changed her leading zone for the future sexual activity the man on the other hand retains his from childhood the main determinants for the woman's preference for the neurosis especially for hysteria lie in this change of the leading zone as well as in the repression of puberty these determinants are therefore most intimately connected with the nature of femininity the object finding while the primacy of the genital zones is being established through the processes of puberty and the erected penis in the man imperiously points toward the new sexual aim that is towards the penetration of a cavity which excites the genital zone the object finding for which also preparations have been made since early childhood becomes consummated on the psychic side while the very incipient sexual gratifications are still connected with the taking of nourishment the sexual impulse has a sexual object outside its own body in his mother's breast this object it loses later perhaps at the very time when it becomes possible for the child to form a general picture of the person to whom the organ granting him the gratification belongs the sexual impulse later regularly becomes autoerotic and only after overcoming the latency period is there a resumption of the original relation it is not without good reason that the suckling of the child at its mother's breast has become a model for every amour the object finding is really a re-finding the sexual object of the nursing period however even after the separation of the sexual activity from the taking of nourishment there still remains from this first and most important of all sexual relations an important share which prepares the object selection and assists in re-establishing the lost happiness throughout the latency period the child learns to love other persons who assisted in its helplessness and gratify its wants all this follows the model and is a continuation of the child's infantile relations to his wet nurse one may perhaps hesitate to identify the tender feelings and esteem of the child for his foster parents with sexual love i believe however that a more thorough psychological investigation will establish this identity beyond any doubt the intercourse between the child and its foster parents is for the former an inexhaustible source of sexual excitation and gratification of erogenous zones especially since the parents or as a rule the mother supplies the child with feelings which originate from her own sexual life she pats it kisses it and rocks it plainly taking it as a substitute for a full-valued sexual object the mother would probably be terrified if it were explained to her that all her tenderness awakens the sexual impulse of her child and prepares its future intensity she considers her actions as asexually pure love for she carefully avoids causing more irritation to the genitals of the child than is indispensable in caring for the body but as we know the sexual impulse is not awakened by the excitation of genital zones alone what we call tenderness will some day surely manifest its influence on the genital zones also if the mother better understood the high significance of the sexual impulse for the whole psychic life and for all ethical and psychic activities the enlightenment would spare her all reproaches by teaching the child to love she only fulfils her function for the child should become a fit man with energetic sexual needs and accomplish in life all that the impulse urges the man to do of course too much parental tenderness becomes harmful because it accelerates the sexual maturity and also because it spoils the child and makes it unfit to temporarily renounce love or be satisfied with a smaller amount of love in later life 
one of the surest premonitions of later nervousness is the fact that the child shows itself insatiable in its demands for parental tenderness on the other hand neuropathic patients who usually display a boundless tenderness often with their caressing awaken in the child a disposition for neurotic diseases this example at least shows that neuropathic parents have nearer ways than inheritance by which they can transfer their disturbances to their children infantile fear the children themselves behave from their early childhood as if their attachment to their foster parents were of the nature of sexual love the fear of children is originally nothing but an expression for the fact that they miss the beloved person they therefore meet every stranger with fear they are afraid of the dark because they cannot see the beloved person and are calmed if they can grasp that person's hand the effect of childish fears and of the terrifying stories told by nurses is overestimated if one blames the latter for producing the fear in children children who are predisposed to fear absorb these stories which make no impression whatever upon others and only such children are predisposed to fear whose sexual impulse is excessive or prematurely developed or has become exigent through pampering the child behaves here like the adult that is it changes its libido into fear when it cannot bring it to gratification and the grown-up who becomes neurotic on account of ungratified libido behaves in his anxiety like a child he fears when he is alone that is without a person whose love he believes himself sure and who can calm his fears by means of the most childish measures incest barriers if the tenderness of the parents for the child has luckily failed to awaken the sexual impulse of the child prematurely that is before the physical determinations for puberty appear and if that awakening has not gone so far as to cause an unmistakable breaking through of the psychic excitement into the genital system it can then fulfil its task and direct the child at the age of maturity in the selection of the sexual object it would of course be most natural for the child to select as the sexual object that person whom it has loved since childhood with so to speak a suppressed libido but owing to the delay of sexual maturity time has been gained for the erection beside the sexual inhibitions of the incest barrier that moral prescription which explicitly excludes from the object selection the beloved person of infancy or blood relation the observance of this barrier is above all a demand of cultural society which must guard against the absorption by the family of those interests which it needs for the production of higher social units society therefore uses every means to loosen those family ties in every individual especially in the boy which are authoritative in childhood only the object selection however is first accomplished in the imagination and the sexual life of the maturing youth has hardly any escape except indulgence in fantasies or ideas which are not destined to be brought to execution in the fantasies of all persons the infantile inclinations now reinforced by somatic emphasis reappear and among them one finds in regular frequency and in the first place the sexual feeling of the child for the parents this has usually already been differentiated by the sexual attraction the attraction of the son for the mother and of the daughter for the father simultaneously with the overcoming and rejection of these distinctly incestuous fantasies there occurs one of the most important as well as one of the most painful psychic accomplishments of puberty it is the breaking away from the parental authority through which alone is formed that opposition between the new and old generations which is so important for cultural progress many persons are detained at each of the stations in the course of development through which the individual must pass and accordingly there are persons who never overcome the parental authority and never or very imperfectly withdraw their affection from their parents they are mostly girls who to the delight of their parents retain their full infantile love far beyond puberty 
and it is instructive to find that in their married life these girls are incapable of fulfilling their duties to their husbands. They make cold wives and remain sexually anesthetic. This shows that the apparently non-sexual love for the parents and the sexual love are nourished from the same source, that is, that the first merely corresponds to an infantile fixation of the libido. The nearer we come to the deepest disturbances of the psychosexual development, the more easily we can recognize the evident significance of the incestuous object selection. As a result of sexual rejection, there remains in the unconscious of the psychoneurotic a great part or the whole of the psychosexual activity for object finding. Girls with an excessive need for affection and an equal horror for the real demands of the sexual life experience an uncontrollable temptation on the one hand to realize in life the ideal of the asexual love, and on the other hand to conceal their libido under an affection which they may manifest without self-reproach. This they do by clinging for life to the infantile attraction for their parents or brothers or sisters which has been repressed in puberty. With the help of the symptoms and other morbid manifestations, psychoanalysis can trace their unconscious thoughts and translate them into the conscious, and thus easily show to such persons that they are in love with their consanguineous relations in the popular meaning of the term. Likewise, when a once healthy person falls sick after an unhappy love affair, the mechanism of the disease can distinctly be explained as a return of his libido to the persons preferred in his infancy. THE AFTER EFFECTS OF THE INFANTILE OBJECT SELECTION Even those who have happily eluded the incestuous fixation of their libido have not completely escaped its influence. It is a distinct echo of this phase of development that the first serious love of the young man is often for a mature woman, and that of the girl for an older man equipped with authority, that is, for persons who can revive in them the picture of the mother and father. Generally speaking, object selection unquestionably takes place by following more freely these prototypes. The man seeks above all the memory picture of his mother, as it has dominated him since the beginning of childhood. This is quite consistent with the fact that the mother, if still living, strives against this, her renewal, and meets it with hostility. In view of this significance of the infantile relation to the parents for the later selection of the sexual object, it is easy to understand that every disturbance of this infantile relation brings to a head the most serious results for the sexual life after puberty. Jealousy of the lover, too, never lacks the infantile sources, or at least the infantile reinforcement. Quarrels between parents and unhappy marital relations between the same determine the severest predispositions for disturbed sexual development or neurotic diseases in the children. The infantile desire for the parents is, to be sure, the most important, but not the only trace revived in puberty which points the way to the object selection. Other dispositions of the same origin permit the man, still supported by his infancy, to develop more than one single sexual series, and to form different determinations for the object selection. Prevention of Inversion One of the tasks imposed in the object selection consists in not missing the opposite sex. This, as we know, is not solved without some difficulty. The first feelings after puberty often enough go astray, though not with any permanent injury. Dessoir has called attention to the normality of the enthusiastic friendships formed by boys and girls with their own sex. The greatest force which guards against a permanent inversion of the sexual object is surely the attraction exerted by the opposite sex characters on each other. For this we can give no explanation in connection with this discussion. This factor, however, does not in itself suffice to exclude the inversion. Besides this, there are surely many other supporting factors. Above all, there is the authoritative inhibition of society. 
experience shows that where the inversion is not considered a crime it fully corresponds to the sexual inclinations of many persons moreover it may be assumed that in the man the infantile memories of the mother's tenderness as well as that of other females who cared for him as a child energetically assist in directing his selection to the woman while the early sexual intimidation experienced through the father and the attitude of rivalry existing between them deflects the boy from the same sex both factors also hold true in the case of the girl whose sexual activity is under the special care of the mother this results in a hostile relation to the same sex which decisively influences the object selection in the normal sense the bringing up of boys by male persons slaves in the ancient times seems to favor homosexuality the frequency of inversion in the present-day nobility is probably explained by their employment of male servants and by the scant care that mothers of that class give to their children it happens in some hysterics that one of the parents has disappeared through death divorce or estrangement thus permitting the remaining parent to absorb all the love of the child and in this way establishing the determinations for the sex of the person to be selected later as the sexual object thus a permanent inversion is made possible end of chapter nine section ten summary it is now time to attempt a summing up we have started from the aberrations of the sexual impulse in reference to its object and aim and have encountered the question whether these originate from a congenital predisposition or whether they are acquired in consequence of influences from life the answer to this question was reached through an examination of the relations of the sexual life of psychoneurotics a numerous group not very remote from the normal this examination has been made through psychoanalytic investigations we have thus found that a tendency to all perversions might be demonstrated in these persons in the form of unconscious forces revealing themselves as symptom creators and we could say that the neurosis is as it were the negative of the perversion in view of the now recognized great diffusion of tendencies to perversion the idea forced itself upon us that the disposition to perversions is the primitive and universal disposition of the human sexual impulse from which the normal sexual behavior develops in consequence of organic changes and psychic inhibitions in the course of maturity we hoped to be able to demonstrate the original disposition in the infantile light among the forces restraining the direction of the sexual impulse we have mentioned shame loathing and sympathy and the social constructions of morality and authority we have thus been forced to perceive in every fixed aberration from the normal sexual life a fragment of inhibited development and infantilism the significance of the variations of the original dispositions had to be put into the foreground but between them and the influences of life we had to assume a relation of cooperation and not of opposition on the other hand as the original disposition must have been a complex one the sexual impulse itself appeared to us as something composed of many factors which in the perversions become separated as it were into its components the perversions thus prove themselves to be on the one hand inhibitions and on the other dissociations from the normal development both conceptions became united in the assumption that the sexual impulse of the adult due to the composition of the diverse feelings of the infantile life became formed into one unit one striving with one single aim we also added an explanation for the preponderance of perversive tendencies in the psychoneurotics by recognizing in these tendencies collateral fillings of side branches caused by the shifting of the main river bed through repression and we then turned our examination to the sexual life of the infantile period we found it regrettable 
that the existence of a sexual life in infancy has been disputed and that the sexual manifestations which have been often observed in children have been described as abnormal occurrences it rather seemed to us that the child brings along into the world germs of sexual activity and that even while taking nourishment it at the same time also enjoys a sexual gratification which it then seeks again to procure for itself through the familiar activity of thumb-sucking the sexual activity of the child however does not develop in the same measure as its other functions but merges first into the so-called latency period from the age of three to the age of five years the production of sexual excitation by no means ceases at this period but continues and furnishes a stock of energy the greater part of which is utilized for aims other than sexual namely on the one hand for the delivery of sexual components for social feelings and on the other hand by means of repression and reaction formation for the erection of the future sexual barriers accordingly the forces which are destined to hold the sexual impulse in certain tracks are built up in infancy at the expense of the greater part of the perverse sexual feelings and with the assistance of education another part of the infantile sexual manifestations escapes this utilization and may manifest itself as sexual activity it can then be discovered that the sexual excitation of the child flows from diverse sources above all gratifications originate through the adapted sensible excitation of so-called erogenous zones for these probably any skin region or sensory organ may serve but there are certain distinguished erogenous zones the excitation of which by certain organic mechanisms is assured from the beginning moreover sexual excitation originates in the organism as it were as a by-product in a great number of processes as soon as they attain a certain intensity this especially takes place in all strong emotional excitements even if they be of a painful nature the excitations from all these sources do not yet unite but they pursue their aim individually this aim consisting merely in the gaining of a certain pleasure the sexual impulse of childhood is therefore objectless or autoerotic still during infancy the erogenous zone of the genitals begins to make itself noticeable either by the fact that like any other erogenous zone it furnishes gratification through a suitable sensible stimulus or because in some incomprehensible way the gratification from other sources causes at the same time the sexual excitement which has a special connection with the genital zone we found cause to regret that a sufficient explanation of the relations between sexual gratification and sexual excitation as well as between the activity of the genital zone and the remaining sources of sexuality was not to be attained we were unable to state what amount of sexual activity in childhood might be designated as normal to the extent of being incapable of further development the character of the sexual manifestation showed itself to be preponderantly masturbatic we moreover verified from experience the belief that the external influences of seduction might produce premature breaches in the latency period leading as far as the suppression of the same and that the sexual impulse of the child really shows itself to be polymorphous perverse furthermore that every such premature sexual activity impairs the educability of the child despite the incompleteness of our examinations of the infantile sexual life we were subsequently forced to attempt to study the serious changes produced by the appearance of puberty we selected two of the same as criteria namely the subordination of all other sources of the sexual feeling to the primacy of the genital zones and the process of object finding 
both of them are already developed in childhood the first is accomplished through the mechanism of utilizing the fore pleasure whereby all other independent sexual acts which are connected with pleasure and excitement become preparatory acts for the new sexual aim the voiding of the sexual products the attainment of which under enormous pleasure puts an end to the sexual feeling at the same time we had to consider the differentiation of the sexual nature of man and woman and we found that in order to become a woman a new repression is required which abolishes a piece of infantile masculinity and prepares the woman for the change of the leading genital zones lastly we found the object selection tracing it through infancy to its revival in puberty we also found indications of sexual inclinations on the part of the child for the parents and foster parents which however were turned away from these persons to others resembling them by the incest barriers which had been erected in the meantime let us finally add that during the transition period of puberty the somatic and psychic processes of development proceed side by side but separately until with the breaking through of an intense psychic love stimulus for the innervation of the genitals the normally demanded unification of the erotic function is established the factors disturbing the development as we have already shown by different examples every step on this long road of development may become a point of fixation and every joint in this complicated structure may afford opportunity for a dissociation of the sexual impulse it still remains for us to review the various inner and outer factors which disturb the development and to mention the part of the mechanism affected by the disturbance emanating from them the factors which we mention here in a series cannot of course all be in themselves of equal validity and we must expect to meet with difficulties in the assigning to the individual factors their due importance constitution and heredity in the first place we must mention here the congenital variation of the sexual constitution upon which the greatest weight probably falls but the existence of which as may be easily understood can be established only through its later manifestations and even then not always with great certainty we understand by it a preponderance of one or another of the manifold sources of the sexual excitement and we believe that such a difference of disposition must always come to expression in the final result even if it should remain within normal limits of course we can also imagine certain variations of the original disposition that even without further aid must necessarily lead to the formation of an abnormal sexual life one can call these degenerative and consider them as an expression of hereditary deterioration in this connection i have to report a remarkable fact in more than half of the severe cases of hysteria compulsion neuroses etc which i have treated by psychotherapy i have succeeded in positively demonstrating that their fathers have gone through an attack of syphilis before marriage they have either suffered from tabies or general paresis or there was a definite history of louise i expressly add that the children who were later neurotic showed absolutely no signs of hereditary louise so that the abnormal sexual constitution was to be considered as the last offshoot of the luetic heredity as far as it is now from my thoughts to put down a descent from syphilitic parents as a regular and indispensable etiological determination of the neuropathic constitution i nevertheless maintain that the coincidence observed by me is not accidental and not without significance the hereditary relations of the positive perverts are not so well known because they know how to avoid inquiry still there is reason to believe that the same holds true in the perversions as in the neuroses we often find perversions and psychoneuroses in the different sexes of the same family so distributed that the male members or one of them is a positive pervert while the females following the repressive tendencies of their sex 
are negative perverts or hysterics this is a good example of the substantial relations between the two disturbances which i have discovered further elaboration it cannot however be maintained that the structure of the sexual life is rendered finally complete by the addition of the diverse components of the sexual constitution on the contrary qualifications continue to appear and new possibilities result depending upon the fate experienced by the sexual streams originating from the individual sources this further elaboration is evidently the final and decisive one while the constitution described as uniform may lead to three final issues if all the dispositions assumed to be abnormal retain their relative proportion and are strengthened with maturity the ultimate result can only be a perverse sexual life the analysis of such abnormally constituted dispositions has not yet been thoroughly undertaken but we already know cases that can be readily explained in the light of these theories authors believe for example that a whole series of fixation perversions must necessarily have had as their basis a congenital weakness of the sexual impulse the statement seems to me untenable in this form but it becomes ingenious if it refers to a constitutional weakness of one factor in the sexual impulse namely the genital zone which later in the interests of propagation accepts as a function the sum of the individual sexual activities in this case the summation which is demanded in puberty must fail and the strongest of the other sexual components continues its activity as a perversion repression another issue results if in the course of development certain powerful components experience a repression which we must carefully note is not a suspension the excitations in question are produced as usual but are prevented from attaining their aim by psychic hindrances and are driven off into many other paths until they express themselves in a symptom the result can be an almost normal sexual life usually a limited one but supplemented by psychoneurotic disease it is these cases that become so familiar to us through the psychoanalytic investigation of neurotics the sexual life of such persons begins like that of perverts a considerable part of their childhood is filled up with perverse sexual activity which occasionally extends far beyond the period of maturity but owing to inner reasons a repressive change then results usually before puberty but now and then even much later and from this point on without any extinction of the old feelings there appears a neurosis instead of a perversion one may recall here the saying junge hure alte bechwester only here youth has turned out to be much too short the relieving of the perversion by the neurosis in the life of the same person as well as the above-mentioned distribution of perversion and hysteria in different persons of the same family must be placed side by side with the fact that the neurosis is the negative of the perversion sublimation the third issue in abnormal constitutional dispositions is made possible by the process of sublimation through which the powerful excitations from individual sources of sexuality are discharged and utilized in other spheres so that a considerable increase of psychic capacity results from an in itself dangerous predisposition this forms one the sources of artistic activity and according as such sublimation is complete or incomplete the analysis of the character of highly gifted especially of artistically disposed persons will show any proportionate blending between productive ability perversion and neurosis a subspecies of sublimation is the suppression through reaction formation which as we have found begins even in the latency period of infancy only to continue throughout life in favorable cases what we call the character of a person is built up to a great extent from the material of sexual excitations it is composed of impulses fixed since infancy and won through sublimation 
and of such constructions as are destined to suppress effectually those perverse feelings which are recognized as useless the general perverse sexual disposition of childhood can therefore be esteemed as a source of a number of our virtues in so far as it incites their creation through the formation of reactions accidental experiences all other influences lose in significance when compared with the sexual discharges shifts of repressions and sublimations the inner determinations for the last two processes are totally unknown to us he who includes repressions and sublimations among constitutional predispositions and considers them as the living manifestations of the same has surely the right to maintain that the final structure of the sexual life is above all the result of the congenital constitution no intelligent person however will dispute that in such a cooperation of factors there is also room for the modifying influences of occasional factors derived from experience in childhood and later on it is not easy to estimate the effectiveness of the constitutional and of the occasional factors in their relation to each other theory is always inclined to overestimate the first while therapeutic practice renders prominent the significance of the latter by no means should it be forgotten that between the two there exists a relation of cooperation and not of exclusion the constitutional factor must wait for experiences which bring it to the surface while the occasional needs the support of the constitutional factor in order to become effective for the majority of cases one can imagine a so-called etiological group in which the declining intensities of one factor become balanced by the rise in the others but there is no reason to deny the existence of extremes at the ends of the group it would be still more in harmony with psychoanalytic investigation if the experiences of early childhood would get a place of preference among the occasional factors the one etiological group then becomes split up into two which may be designated as the dispositional and the definitive groups constitution and occasional infantile experiences are just as cooperative in the first as disposition and later traumatic experiences in the second group all the factors which injure the sexual development show their effect in that they produce a regression or a return to a former phase of development we may now continue with our task of enumerating the factors which have become known to us as influential for the sexual development whether they be active forces or merely manifestations of the same prematurity such a factor is the spontaneous sexual prematurity which can be definitely demonstrated at least in the etiology of the neuroses though in itself it is as little adequate for causation as the other factors it manifests itself in a breaking through shortening or suspending of the infantile latency period and becomes a cause of disturbances inasmuch as it provokes sexual manifestations which either on account of the unready state of the sexual inhibitions or because of the undeveloped state of the genital system can only carry along the character of perversions these tendencies to perversion may either remain as such or after the repression sets in they may become motive powers for neurotic symptoms at all events the sexual prematurity renders difficult the desirable later control of the sexual impulse by the higher psychic influences and enhances the compulsive like character which even without this prematurity would be claimed by the psychic representatives of the impulse sexual prematurity often runs parallel with premature intellectual development it is found as such in the infantile history of the most distinguished and most productive individuals and in such connection it does not seem to act as pathogenically as when appearing isolated temporal factors just like prematurity other factors which under the designation of temporal can be added to prematurity also demand consideration it seems to be phylogenetically established in what sequence the individual impulsive feelings become active 
and how long they can manifest themselves before they succumb to the influence of a newly appearing active impulse or to a typical repression but both in this temporal succession as well as in the duration of the same variations seem to occur which must exercise a definite influence on the experience it cannot be a matter of indifference whether a certain stream appears earlier or later than its counterstream for the effect of a repression cannot be made retrogressive a temporal deviation in the composition of the components regularly produces a change in the result on the other hand impulsive feelings which appear with special intensity often come to a surprisingly rapid end as in the case of the heterosexual attachment of the later manifest homosexuals the strivings of childhood which manifest themselves most impetuously do not justify the fear that they will lastingly dominate the character of the grown-up one has as much right to expect that they will disappear in order to make room for their counterparts harsh masters do not rule long to what one may attribute such temporal confusions of the processes of development we are hardly able to suggest a view is opened here to a deeper phalanx of biological and perhaps also historical problems which we have not yet approached within fighting distance adhesion the significance of all premature sexual manifestations is enhanced by a psychic factor of unknown origin which at present can be put down only as a psychological preliminary i believe that it is the heightened adhesion or fixedness of these impressions of the sexual life which in later neurotics as well as in perverts must be added for the completion of the other facts for the same premature sexual manifestations in other persons cannot impress themselves deeply enough to repeat themselves compulsively and to succeed in prescribing the way for the sexual impulse throughout later life perhaps a part of the explanation for this adhesion lies in another psychic factor which we cannot miss in the causation of the neuroses namely in the preponderance which in the psychic life falls to the share of memory traces as compared with recent impressions this factor is apparently dependent on the intellectual development and grows with the growth of personal culture in contrast to this the savage has been characterized as the unfortunate child of the moment owing to the oppositional relation existing between culture and the free development of sexuality the results of which may be traced far into the formation of our life the problem how the sexual life of the child evolves is of very little importance for the later life in the lower stages of culture and civilization and of very great importance in the higher fixation the influence of the psychic factors just mentioned favored the development of the accidentally experienced impulses of the infantile sexuality the latter especially in the form of seductions through other children or through adults produce the material which with the help of the former may become fixed as a permanent disturbance a considerable number of the deviations from the normal sexual life observed later have been thus established in neurotics and perverts from the beginning through the impressions received during the alleged sexually free period of childhood the causation is produced by the responsiveness of the constitution the prematurity the quality of heightened adhesion and the accidental excitement of the sexual impulse through outside influence the unsatisfactory conclusions which have resulted from this investigation of the disturbances of the sexual life is due to the fact that we as yet know too little concerning the biological processes in which the nature of sexuality consists to form from our isolated examinations a satisfactory theory for the explanation of either the normal or the pathological end of section ten end of three contributions to the theory of sex by sigmund freud this is books on my mind youtube channel Listen to world's best and high quality audiobooks. Click on the subscribe button for more.